Thanks. Um, I can go ahead and go ahead. Go in. Um, my, this is Dharma Bennett. I work in the Office of Information Management and Analysis at the Water Board, and I'm the program manager for the California Environmental Data Exchange Network, or CDIN, which we talked about yesterday. And uh, maybe Julian, you want to go now? Sure. Uh, Julian Fulton, I'm an associate professor in environmental studies at Sac State. Um, and presented yesterday on a, a citizen science data exchange project that I'm um, helping to facilitate uh, to help connect community monitoring of trash in the environment to, um, to cities and MS4 permittees that need uh, data for their uh, programming and compliance. So interested in, in those links between community science and uh, actual environmental governance. Gary, how are you doing with that mic? No, oh, I fixed it. Yeah, cool. sorry, my audio isn't working. Um, yeah, Gary Conley, I'm Chief Scientist at Second Nature. Um, I just like getting piles of data and trying to make them into something that helps us make better decisions. And I, I'm kind of hopeful that today we're actually gonna make like a few steps in that direction with our trash data. So excited to get into it with everybody. So all the facilitators have um, gone and anybody feel free to just un unmute and um, speak up. Or you can raise your hand. Yeah, Joseph. Hey, uh, Joseph Martinez from the Region 2 Water Board. Um, I came to this group today because I was excited to keep um, working on, you know, what was started yesterday. and. Um, you know, again, hopefully contribute to this discussion and, and also hear about um, challenges uh, coming up uh, for track two folks. Thank you, Mika. Yeah, hi, my name is Mika and I'm with the city of Reading and um, I manage the stormwater program for the city. Bob. I'm Bob Hollis, I'm with uh, Mobius Intelligent Systems. Uh, we do a lot of work uh, with data analytics, ML, AI, and sustainable materials management, uh, working with about 30 cities throughout California on the land side of things, and doing a lot of work with the uh, Valley Foothill Watersheds Collaborative, the American Basin uh, Group, and right now in the water side. And I'm uh, really looking forward to the presentations today. Thank you. See Caitlin. Hi, I'm Caitlin, and I work for the city of San Francisco, and I help to oversee the implementation of our stormwater program. So I'm just here to learn. Thank you. <clears throat> Would anybody else like to introduce themselves? You can feel free to unmute or raise your hand or turn on your video and I can call on you, whatever you'd like. I see Andrea. Hi everyone, this is Andrea De Lapa. I'm a project manager with the Council for Watershed Health in uh, Pasadena, Los Angeles. And uh, I actually work on a fish passage study for uh, Southern California steelhead, but we do have projects at the council that are uh, actually looking at data collection and monitoring of trash. And uh, so I'm definitely interested in the type of conversation and uh, cross-pollination that we can get from all the people uh, working in this uh, and discussing in this uh, work group. And I'm definitely happy to uh listening to the problem and uh, discussing potential solution particularly for data collection and uh, how to use it thank you nice to see you um justin 
Hi, I'm Justin McConnell with the Chino Basin Watermaster. Um, we deal with a lot of uh, trash in our recharge basins uh, and through our stormwater channels. Uh, and we partner with the flood control district. So I'm here just to kind of learn, uh, learn something new about the, the trash aspect that seems to be affecting our basin. Uh, I apologize in behalf, uh, uh, in advance, uh, I will be kind of jumping in and out uh, of this uh, as I kind of juggle duties on a Friday. No worries, totally understandable. Thank you for being here. Would anyone else like to introduce themselves? All right, cool. Well, there will be plenty of time throughout and we can uh, get to continue to get to know each other. So, oops, I muted myself. All right, I'm gonna go on to the next slide. So a uh, recap from yesterday. Um, yesterday, what we did is we worked on this thing called a data flow map. Um, and essentially what that is, is it is a, a uh, map of how data goes from being created um, to ending up with some regulator um, or, you know, some data doesn't go to a regulator. Um, but in this data flow map, I originally just proposed this as a straw man um, because I didn't really know how data was flowing for the trash amendments data. Um, and so the straw man was um, that somebody creates the data and they hand that off to a database manager. Um, and then that person might send it to an open data web portal. Um, and the database manager then might send it also to a data analyst who will report to the city council um, or to a regulator. Um, and it turns out somehow I got pretty close, I think, to what the actual data flow map looks like for track two trash amendments. Um, so that was lucky. We did learn though uh, some major differences or some kind of like nuances to this are that um, sometimes there's just one person doing all of these or most of them. Um, that was one. And then also track two trash amendments have lots of different types of data. Um, so we can't be sure that all data is going to flow the same way. Sometimes there will be data flowing to certain limbs and other data not. Um, and so, yeah, so we learned that. And I'll also briefly show our Jamboards too. But before I do that, I don't wanna forget our other, our puns on this slide, which is, I will relish our catch up meeting. <laughs> Uh, heard that one before, Dijon Vu. <laughs> All right, um, I'm gonna, so I'll drop these links in the chat because this is kind of like, these are our, um, uh, let's see. There's, so there's two different links there that I just dropped in the chat. And these are our products from yesterday. Um, we broke off into two groups and really dove into each of these components, the creation, the database management. We found, I think right now, we're kind of still at a phase where not a lot of this data has been sent to regulators. So that part of the flow map is still in development and, and we don't really have a lot of information about that right now. Um, but for the most part, people had a pretty clear idea and con conceptualization of, of the rest of what's going on right now. Um, and uh, I think also people haven't really started to put this data up on open data web portals. That was the other, the other major thing, uh, just because it's, it's still so new. It's just been being collected over the past couple of years. Um, and what did I want to do? I wanted to open up one of these Jamboards so you could see them. Um, and you're welcome to share these around. Um, so this is an idea of, of what we did, you know, who's creating the data, um, what, what kind of data are they collecting, what are some of the gaps and barriers associated with that, what are some of the opportunities. I'll, um, 
it's actually really hard to summarize, especially the other one, because we found out there's a lot of a lot of nuances to this um, where there's just like there's so many different players that are collecting data and using the data um, that it's I can't it's kind of difficult to summarize. But the general flow map is is like how things are how things are happening. So that's at least clear. And then the rest of this was brainstorming to find to uh, to learn about different um, gaps and barriers. Some of the major learnings that from our group was that uh, like the online visual trash assessment is pretty um, uh, pretty subjective scoring. And so you can have like one group comes and does the OVTA and then another group comes and does the same thing and they have slightly different scores. And so like having really specific training is really really critical and that might be a future kind of knowledge gap and barrier that we need so that we can actually compare apples to apples one city to another um i don't know if there's from the other facilitators or uh if you all had any other major shangs you wanted to share or major uh gaps barriers opportunities you wanted to share from your breakout yeah i think that just that the 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 diversity of ways to do things um, that there's no there's no kind of dominant model that emerged um, lots of ways to get from the creation to the use side um, and initially we thought that some kind of dominant model might emerge and that doesn't seem to be emerging which is which is fine but there's obviously a lot of options and and different models going on here. Um, so that's so that's cool, and that's the, those differences. I think are what we want to talk about today. Um, yeah, so that's that's what sort of popped out for me. And I could when I could just speak to kind of the uh, the opportunity side on our little map there. Um, often, you know, you set out building a structure, a database that reflects our conceptual model of how the how the system works without the opportunity first to collect very much data, but that's not the case in, in this instance, right? We've, there's like we just said, people have been collecting data in a few different ways that in various ways reflect their objectives as an organization needs as a, as a, as a permittee. And so we're in a really good position right now. There's a tremendous opportunity that we're all taking advantage of right now to construct what we want to that's um, truly fit for purpose for what, what we need the system to do in terms of filling our information needs for answering management questions. And so it, it feels a little bit chaotic because there's all this, you know, a, a lot of diversity like Julian was saying of the way that data are being collected and used, but it, it's really useful information we, we the normal uh, way to go about this would be to set out without that information and regret some of the choices that you've made for how you've built the system. So so this is this is great, and um, I hope we make a few steps uh, forward today. Jeremiah, I see you have your hand raised. Yeah, I was noticed on the um, step one that you were just showing um, under the what and how and where there was a note that said open source app. Could um, that breakout group talk about what that is? Is that something that's in, in use right now? And, um, or is that a future? I actually don't know who, who put that up. Um, the way that our breakout group ended up working is kind of like everyone heads down and uh, and just we just had this big sort of post-it fest going on for the half hour. Um, but Sorry. if I had to guess, I would agree with Joseph. Um, probably survey one, two, three, which is an ESRI product and um, is is uh, is a free app. And as long as someone with a license creates it, creates the um, the uh, um, uh, input the field the form thank you yeah wh whoever inputs the form has a license and that has a place to go 
the data has a place to go, then anyone can use the app. Okay, yeah, that uh, would be interesting too. If the person who added that um, could, uh, if they're here today, um, let us know if that if that is what Julian described is what you, um, was meant by that. And it, um, if others, a lot of people are using that the the one form or everybody's, you know, has their own form and um, you know how popular is that? Could could we, you know strategize around that maybe yeah uh, andrea had had his hand up maybe we could get yes to him real quick thanks Wayne. actually it was me to add that open source app post it and uh, i'm i included because uh, in one of the projects that we are conducting at the council basically we are partnering with students in the biology department from the pasadena city college and basically, as part of one of their class projects during the semester, they collect information on trash. And we created for them uh, these ESRI 123 uh, maps. So it's really useful to us. And this was the first year that we started collecting this information. But the plan will be to continue in future semester with other students. Uh, Clearly, there was some issues with the pandemic. They were not allowed to collect in the data uh, in the spring, but uh, it's a really powerful uh, tool uh, to collect information. And also we make sure that we standardize basically the categories using the same categories that were used by other effort that have been conducted in uh, California and I, th I believe nationwide. And so I think it will be a useful way to standardize this data. And the idea will be to uh, create similar app and the data collection also for high school projects, maybe other uh, uh, community college or uh, other university within the LA River watershed. Mm -hmm. And uh, then collaborating will be with academia for the analysis, not just the mapping, but I think it will be useful as a baseline information to create maybe some hotspot analysis to understand in which section of the LA River maybe there is a need to intervene uh, for the reduction of trash. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that, for that additional information. Yeah, thank you, Andrea. Do you uh, happen to have any sample data or at least the um, a, a sample spreadsheet with the headers and the fields that are collected that we could look at uh, as part of today at some point? I don't have it right now because uh, okay. I'm yeah. not the project manager for that project, but if people are interested in taking a look at it uh, and I will uh, just put in the chat my email, you can reach out to me and I can get back to you. Great, thank you. So Gary had his email. Uh, yeah, the, uh, I just wanted to say about, um, these open source apps, we created one some time ago. I've just put a link into the, into the chat that describes the one that we built. There's sort of a, Esri collector is really useful because you can stream as you go, but survey one, two, three doesn't have that capability. Um, so it's, um, but it, you can get it to everybody, which is great. Um, and so what we found, so there's this document that's up on the screen now, there's just a description of the field protocol, how you go get the app, how it, how it corresponds with these field protocols we've discussed in the last day or so. It essentially cr creates the same data as the collector app, except you just can't create polylines. You can only do points, which is fine. Um, and <laughs> what we found is not very many people use it. You know, like mo most, it's, you know, people are using it for compliance. And so I think the gap that we've identified as a firm trying to help cities meet their compliance requirements and trying to get the public engaged in this way is, um, is just the outreach component and in getting it into, into the hands of people that will find it useful. Um, and so that's where I think, um, you know, folks like us and can uh, partnering with um, Andrea and, and, and Julian, um, you guys are engaged with, with people to, to try to get to use these things. And so we can, provide our schema for this one that we've created and, and hopefully what, maybe there's some ultimate one that's a mishmash of, of you know, we're not married to the, the way that we've created this one, 
already at, at all. We can ingest whatever data into our system. Um, but I think that's the key is getting, getting the people, people engaged. And that's what we've done a terrible job of <laughs> up to now. And I think you guys can help with. All right. Um, other questions, comments about what people are seeing in the uh, in the Jamboards? Thoughts from that? You want to flip back to it, Win? We're still looking. Yeah. At the screen here. I know. I'm. I'm like stuck. There's this thing in my way on the Zoom. There we go. Ah. Okay. Wait. Ah. <laughs> And uh, Janet, I see, I see a couple of your questions. Name the software used to make the displays. Uh, you mean, do you mean these jam boards right here that we're looking at right now? Yes, thank you. Yeah, the, um, I'll, I'll put the, uh, so Jamboard is a, is a Google product. So everything is uh, on the web and I just put the link again and this is how you can, can access it. And even after we, shut down today, you'll, you'll be able to access this. Yeah. Got it, thank you. Do you think that we could get a copy of the PowerPoint that uh, you are presenting and then Gary was presenting? Uh, this one here? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I can even share this with you. Um, I can you. drop a link to it right now. Maybe I Thank should you, change you. the link just so nobody accidentally uh, don't, don't take it away. changes something. Oh, if I do that, then I won't be able to share it either. I'll, uh, I'll just, I'll give the edit permission link and just don't change anything until after, until after the presentation. No problem. <laughs> I understand. Thank you so yeah. much. Maybe make a copy. Oh, I already, I already shared wow. it. <laughs> I can do it. <laughs> there should be a way. Uh, the, the Google Slides that Tony shared yeah. yesterday. Were, yeah. Uh, OK. I don't know how to. I'll, I'll make it. I'll make one. I'll make one right now. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going rogue, Jarma. <laughs> People ask for data, and I just hand it over. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. Cool. And while you're doing that, I saw also, I think it was in the, the next set of Jamboards, an open source database. Um, and I was wondering if uh, who was using that. And uh, again, if that's something that maybe we could leverage. Um, I mean, it sounds like, as Gary was saying, there are pointing out that there were there are a lot of these different tools out there um, and yet I think people are still creating new ones and and maybe we could get a um, a one a one-stop shop to like share whatever you know not no endorsements or anything but just at least here are some you know open source tools here are some tools that you could pay for here are some you know just a, so people aren't reinventing uh, the wheel. Good idea. And one one point on that, Jarma, if like the even if I mean I think most people are using like open source tools like PostGIS or Postgres databases like we are to to host these data. But as long as the data are available, anybody can do right. They could make, they could build an application to display the data if they want. As long as it seems like the data flowing freely is the most important thing. I, maybe it's a difference in terminology from open source to open data or something. However, the data are stored as long as I can just move to whoever needs to get them. Seem, seems the primary thing we want to drive towards. Um, maybe that is the, the end goal, but it, it perhaps that if we had if people were using the same database, it would be easier to have the, the data 
um, flow in that same way. De definitely agree. We should have yeah some centralized place yeah. that all the data can get to. Yeah, hi, this is Andrea again. I was the one including the recommendation. <laughs> so let me just explain. I was basically following your same line of thinking. I was still just thinking that I know that there are a lot of people out there using these different type of apps. So at least in the Los Angeles River watershed, we are not the only one using these uh, ESRI apps. So just making sure that maybe everyone is using a format that can be shared and maybe just use a central database as, as a repository that first of all is open source so that everybody can use that data. Even if when we talk about gap and uh, potential uh, implication, people are always super uh, uh, defensive of their data and maybe they don't want to share it. But I think that definitely creating a, a centralized database where everybody can just pull the data and everybody else can use the data for the same purpose might be a good way to go. Now, who will have to be in charge to do that? Uh, that's a totally different question. If it's an agency or, uh, or academia or others, maybe this is something that can be discussed. Well, this is, these are great conversations. Um, did you, you have something else to add? Oh, no, just, yeah, um, I think that's the crux of, of figuring out, yeah, where, okay, where does this thing live and, and who maintains it? And CDEN is an obvious target. Um, we did, just because, like we said yesterday, it's like it doesn't, the work doesn't go away once we, uh, once we create the, the structure. And I, I mean, I, I, had two different iterations of, of this process with NOAA in the creation of the integrated ocean observing systems where people have their own observing networks all over the country. And the idea was let's get all these things fed to a, you know, to a centralized system. And then again, with creation of the swamp protocols, which developed into CDEN, in both cases, it was just getting a critical mass of people in a room to argue about what that structure mm -hmm. should be. And, and carrying on from there. And so that, that's what I'm hoping is that we can glom on that critical mass from, from this group here to get that nascent structure. Yeah, can you elaborate on that, on that structure? Like what, what, what do you mean by structure? Oh, like Andrea was saying, like a common, well, if we say like a schema, a, a structure, a common format in terms of a, what we're defining fields as, what are the, as, as Jarma worked with, the controlled vocabularies associated with each of those fields? What are the business rules associated with, um, with uh, what, what fields do what? How, what's the level of normalization in, in the tables or where do records repeat? Just all those structural elements that determine, those things sort of determine like how you can pull data out and everyone's objectives are going to weigh on the way in which it needs to get pulled out. So those are things that we want to make sure everybody's on the same page. The easiest thing to think about is just like, well, I call a survey type this and you call a survey type that. Let's figure out the right word to call it. Yeah, yeah that's a really good segue into our first breakout or first uh, focus of today to dive into some of these data sets that we have. Um, I'm going to drop this, this link into the chat. Um, we actually have three now. <laughs> yeah, we have three data sets to dive Thank into. You. Um, and if anybody else has trash amendment data, please share it to that if you feel comfortable. Um, you can also just share the fields, like the, the column names for the data set. That's enough for today for us to dive into most things. Um, so that would also be useful if you're comfortable sharing that. Um, but we definitely have quite a bit to work with, even with just three data sets. So, um, so this will be good. Um, so, yeah. Um, so we're going to, when we dive into this data, I, I think really a good product for today would be that what we call a minimum viable field list. 
which is basically like which of these fields are in common within these data sets. So I, I dropped the link into the chat so everybody can access this database and open up these three data, data sets. Um, I think it's accomplishable in the next, what, like we have 45 minutes or something? Um, yeah, 45 minutes, 50 minutes to make a minimum viable data set and have, have some discussion about some of these other questions too. Like what are the different information gaps? Um, does the data you collect help you to improve your waste management? How so? Uh, what data would be most useful, more useful to collect? Um, are the data sets comparable to one another? Can we assess compliance? Um, so how does, how does that sound as like a focus for right now? Yeah. Go through the the three data sets, noting that I think the gradient one is a was a test file. Is that right? Um, uh, yeah, that concentration gradients, that was just me uploading some random stuff. Okay. So we do have three. <laughs> so going through those and um, working mm. uh, on the finding the, the commonalities and the gaps. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I Barry think I just threw one in the ring too. We got four. No, oh, all right. Three. Well, we'll have discussions along the way. We'll kind of, we'll start by opening up one of these data sets on the screen and then have just like have open dialogue going um, about the data and with the goal of narrowing down which of these do we need in, in seed in or in some centralized database if we were going to actually be able to get all the data sets in there. Sounds great. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so this is data set number one. It's called San Diego River Trash. I don't know whose data set it is. If you're here right now mm -hmm. and would like to present your data set, um, you can. Or if you're not, if that person is not here, we could also start with another one where um, somebody has uh, some. Somebody is here. Is the San Diego River Trash person here? Okay, how about the uh, Sac State EPA grant? Is that person? I can talk here? a bit about that, but there's actually yeah. two other participants here, uh, Bob Hollis and Zane Harvey, who um, uh, are actually the ones that helped set all this up um, in collaboration with Keep California Beautiful um, and could probably speak to it much more directly. Um, Zane, Bob, uh, would appreciate your, your input as we, as we go through this. And I'm happy to introduce it from our perspective or my perspective, but um, we're trying to, as I said in my intro, um, create a data exchange for um, citizen science groups to submit data. They're using S3123. Um, and these are groups that are organized by Keep California Beautiful um, to collect data as the trash are being picked up. So they're able to sort of go into a, uh, more granular, granular level of detail, um, actually counting the number of different material types, uh, material groups and material categories. And so that's the reason why this, this spreadsheet is, I think, 80 something columns wide is because, um, those represent all the fields that are um, that are available for input. Uh, the different actual materials, which are organized into eighty, I think it's down to like sixty categories. Um, it used to be a list of like one hundred and twenty something uh, material categories, but um, that got narrowed down for the sake of uh, um, making it simpler. But um, these, these categories, as far as I understand it, um, and has been explained to me by Christine Flowers, who works with KCB, is, um, is that these categories align with um, the way that Caltrans and other departments of transportation around the country collect their trash data. So it's a, it's a, it's a specific taxonomy um, that uh, is, in theory, universal. 
or it, it, it could be seen as, a, as, as widely applicable. Um, so it doesn't go into as specific detail as maybe some groups want. It maybe has more detail than other groups want. So it's, uh, it's sort of a middle ground, but it, it, it offers that possibility to input um, numbers of these or counts of these uh, pieces. Um, other fields that are collected are to, to make, try and make it um, usable in this context are uh, the OVTA, the Onland Visual Trash Assessment, which is actually to the left um, in column uh, I. So what is the, right now it's what is the litter assessment? And there's training that goes into that so that users um, you know, imagine that you're you're the 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 data input um, person, and you've been trained by a community group, a community leader, hopefully working with the city staff um, to to know what is a two, what is a a one. So the for those that aren't familiar, the online visual trash assessment is a subjective scale, a qualitative assessment of on a scale of one to four, with one being no litter present and a four being a heavily littered area. So that's the so that's the that piece of it, the OVTA that Wynn said is the um, kind of the, the core of these data sets, hopefully, and is necessary for compliance for these permittees. Um, some other fields that are collected are the inputter's name, whether they have uh, uh, protective equipment, which is mostly a COVID thing, um, and then where they're surveying. And this, this location, uh, uh, the locational uh, fields, there's, there's, a, there's an X, Y, lat, latitude, longitude point, um, but what they're, what, what they're really surveying is an area. And Gary, you mentioned this before too, the difference between a, being able to have a one data input, one row be a point versus a, versus a line or a polygon. Um, this is input as points, but what we're trying to do is figure out ways to associate those points with the priority land uses. Um, those are the areas that permittees need to assess. Um, and so that is part of the training that we're expecting this to, to go along with this, which is to have users of this, of this app and this um, collector, that's the term I was blanking on before, this collector, that they, um, that they input the appropriate priority land use uh, reference name or number. Um, and right now we've just, sort of, these are just sort of site descriptions, but um, for example, CSU site two, that, that first row of data, is I, I believe reference to a priority land use for our campus um, trash implementation plan. So we, we are a permittee, our campus is a permittee. And so we have, we have designated priority land uses and our implementation plan requires us to assess particular sites. So, um, so that's a little spin through, through that. And uh, happy to, the sort of spitball ideas for improvement or how it intersects with other ones. Jarma, you get your hand up. Uh, I noticed that it asks how many child volunteers, but it doesn't ask how many overall volunteers. But was there a reason? I don't know the reason for that. Maybe Zane or Bob knows. We don't have- we, we eventually got rid of that question. That was something that just got left over. So we don't ask that anymore. Oh, okay. Uh, thanks, thanks yeah. Zane. One of the things I'll, I'll comment on that carries over from the AI ML session yesterday is we talked about the importance of getting consistency in the way things are measured so that people can share data across uh, data sets more easily and know they're generally measuring the same things. So uh, that was one of the things we were aiming for here. And it's similar to something that Keep America Beautiful has been using for like 10 or 15 years. And Cecile Carson had part in developing that originally and then did a lot of this work with uh, Christine Flowers and collaborating with Julian and uh, Professor Jin at Sac State and then working with us on the tech side. Uh, but, but Zane did all of the uh, 
the coding and can talk more about things we did specifically there if people have questions. Uh, but that that's one of the things we were aiming for that the overall with data, if you can get people collecting things in the same way, it makes it a lot easier to share and a lot easier to you know look at the big picture across different projects. Um, did you consider putting the the unit for the weight in the heading so that you could just have a controlled numeric field? And, um, that's a good point. That that's one of the last uh, columns, I think. Yeah, B Y. Approximate weight. Yeah, we should have the. I'm assuming it's pounds, but. Um, yeah, I would appreciate any suggestions on this. We we have a, a wish list, which I don't think we've shared with you, Zane and Bob, but because um, <laughs> because we know that doing things one piece at a time is hard. We want to give you a bunch of stuff at the same time. So this is a, an opportunity. Uh, send it as you get it. Uh, yeah. Yeah? Zane is a scrum master and he'll get it worked in. OK. Yeah. And uh, Julian covered it pretty well, but I'm happy to share my screen and show you the actual survey. Uh, just so you can get an idea uh, what they're collecting with the the uh, survey one two three yes. collector yeah so this sure. is uh, an app that's available uh, with through Estrie's ArcGIS platform and uh, this is a desktop version of it but it's available in all the app stores. And obviously most of the field data collection is done on phones or tablets out in the field. But we do have some surveys that we do that are done on desktops and they use this uh, app on there. You can see I'm on a Mac Air right now. So, and it's also available for Windows. They first, uh, they download the survey and then they have to authenticate. We do username and passwords for a lot of uh, people that do surveys, or we can just have a generic one, as you can see here, data and collector. Once they're authenticated, they're presented with the survey and they can start to enter data. Um, this is a very simple survey. You can build a lot of con uh, complicated logic and a lot of hidden, you know, only show questions um, depending on previous answers and such. You can do lots and lots of things with the logic and how the survey is presented. This one's very simple. And you can see here, uh, you basically just work through the fields. Um, and then they do the Likert scale for the litter assessment, uh, grab their GPS location, mark some things about location, and then uh, there's counters to be able to pick how many pieces of each of these items that they found or they saw. And as uh, Julian um, noted, this, this list was developed in conjunction with other groups. So this is uh, you know kind of becoming a standardized list and one of the things that Bob said is we'd like to have more standards in data collection uh, so that the data sets can be combined and things like that better. So uh, number of volunteers and then so we just have there just a total number of volunteers, not we don't ask anything about number of children uh, anymore, total number of bags filled. And then, yeah, we can put it. Uh, this is pounds, but we should uh, that would probably be included in the training, uh, but absolutely it should be, you know, labeled there. So. You can have hints and things, and so uh, we can. We'll definitely put the the pounds there, and then uh, you know we have right now the possibility of five images, but we can uh, adapt this survey. As Julian was saying, they have a wish list, so if they send it over, we will um, get it in there. So the data um, primarily was taken in Sacramento and uh, L.A. in the Los Angeles region. And there's only 14 points for this one. So that's the first thing to know. Um, for this EPA, there were only 14 piece, uh, data points. So only 14 surveys submitted. Yeah, we're just, really just piloting it right now. Exactly. Jeremiah, I notice you have your hand up. Oh, that was before. Not intentional. Um, well, since, since you called on me, I can, you know, if, I mean, I don't, I don't think this would be that much uh, different than the seed and format if you rotated it and uh, you know, repeated um, some of the, the columns. So like the, the station name or whatever um, you guys call it, the site name. Um, and then like 
you know, what we would call the analyte would be uh, rugs, textiles, and then the result would be the, the count. Um, so I think it'd be a, a fairly straightforward rotation to make a batch up. Are you talking about on the analytics side or on the survey design side? Uh, just on the uh, the data output side. Oh, sure. Side. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, we can do lots of things with, you know, make this, right now it's just a linear top to bottom and that's how they wanted it, but we can do grids and pages and repeats and all this stuff. But uh, this is a very simple survey, but you're yeah. talking about the actual, you know, we don't really have enough data to analyze yet, but yeah, like you're saying, uh, yeah, once we, once we get enough data, we will absolutely do that. Yeah, I, I was thinking ahead to um, um, if we if we could get it to um, line up with uh, the seed and format a database that I uh, work with, then um, it would be easier to to you know upload the output to seed and you know if that's the direction we wanted to go. The data goes into uh, Estri's database, which they call Feature Service. And then what we do is we run scripts to put them into our own data warehouses. Uh, typically for this type of stuff, we'll just use MySQL. And then we have dashboards, uh, not for this one, but for other ones, other surveys, we have dashboards and uh, uh, data portals where they can go and download this. Uh, S3 is uh, overall, we well, uh, it it's, uh, requires licenses. Let's just say that, and those cost money. We have ways that we can make the data available uh, for free. Thanks, Sam. Uh, Gary, you've got your hand up. Yeah, just I just wanted to comment. Um, the other thing, doing that, um, the ro the table, the rotation of the table structure, as Jarma is suggesting, is I think that would make it more amenable to adopting um, you know, the trash taxonomy that, correct me if I'm wrong, when the, that you guys were working on because then you would have, your field would essentially be you know, something like material and item and you can have a controlled vocabulary for what all those item types are rather than them actually being field headers. So you would compress the, the number of fields having it more vertically oriented like that, like Jarma said, you'd be repeating things like the date and the location and everything. But when those tables are, um, you can normalize those tables so that those, the actual values are stored in a, in a different table. Um, yeah, I think that would be, that would be great. So you're, uh, Jarma, you're primarily talking about rotating the, the, the material types and making those one field in a right. In a, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, you'd have a type field, column, and account field. And that's what yeah, you have a, an analyte. I have another data set that I have ready to show on a data portal. It's for the Department of Water Resources, California. Do you guys want to see that? Sure. Is it is it related to the trash amendments data? Uh, I don't know about Bob. Do you know that answer to that trash amendments? Um, oh, sorry. What are survey is this? This is the D DWR citizen scientist litter survey. Um, very, it's basically the almost the same exact survey, mm -hmm. uh, but it's just for a different application. And uh, you can see here they can come and download this. So this is we take it from Estri's feature service, which um, we can get people access to, but that you know they they have to buy licenses. Here they can just come and download this, and this stays in sync. We run a cron job, so cool. Yeah, th so this is for a, a project that DWR is funding to to look at trash in, at at a watershed scale. So they're collaborating with entities that are responsible for trash amendments, but it's it's a it's a it's a watershed scale assessment. So they're doing creeks and they're doing streets also. But they also use the one through four assessment. Yeah. yeah, Keep California Beautiful has been doing the one through four for, for decades because um, they've worked on, they, they call it the community appearance index and they've been doing these assessments for cities um, for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's, very, it's very compatible with the OBTA. Okay. 
Um, I think one thing that would be really useful right now, just in the in the uh, thought of time, is to look at a second data set from another group and then start to ask these interesting questions of like, are they comparable? Where are they breaking down and stuff? I know Gary just shared one of his. Um, did anybody else have like a really itching data set they wanted to share? Or a... Not itching data set, happy data set. <laughs> there's a there's a pun somewhere there. Yeah, yeah I know. Work on it. <laughs> yeah, a trashy data set. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Can I share my screen when? Burning uh, trash database. I think you have access. I think so. Uh, okay. I'll do that. You guys see my screen? Yes. Can you guys see my screen? Thumbs up. Okay. You guys are seeing my screen, right? I see your desk, like your blue yep. window screen. Oh God, that's, sorry. Okay, there we go. There's a map. Okay, so um, I'll just show you the structure. These, they're pretty simple. It's not gonna take very long to describe. Um, we have uh, tabular data we can look at. Um, I just put the link in the chat to this one. There's just not that much to them because now we're talking about these trash condition surveys. So essentially you have a shape, a polyline or a point, um, a condition, right? These qualitative surveys, low up to very high. Um, the data was created, the person that has done the survey, whether there's photos linked to it, the length of, of the shape, et cetera. So there's, it's mostly related to the geometry of the data, so it's a little more useful to look at, um, you know, on a on a map spatially. So this is this is what they look like when you actually put those data on the map. And so that tabular data would have a link to the spatial data if it if it lives somewhere. If like it's all one polyline in a survey that you did, um, and so just on the map, you just you know have a pretty small amount of information as well. This is that trash condition, this area during the survey time was in that moderate condition. Joe is the one that collected it and he used the Esri mobile collector app to get those data. And so you have lines and, and points, um, but you have the fields in there that you can, you know, you can filter it by whoever took the survey, by the date. We're just looking right now at dates that started from May of this year. So there's been, um, you know, there's been surveys for other, other um, times this year. Uh, it, it just, this, so this is a constrained, um, constrained period of those, those dates. The other thing that's important that, you know, every one of these has a location, right? And so some of these questions that we're talking about have to do with the transport and sources of trash. And so because the data are spatial, you can put them into a geospatial data. As you can see, as I'm scrolling over, right, these are all catchments. These are delineated drainages. So, the, so you know something about where the trash is going to go that's deposited on the streets here. And you can also integrate those with um, those drainage areas that serve those full capture devices. So having the data in this geospatial context makes them a lot more useful. It just creates something of a challenge for how we right, integrate them with other tabular types of, of data. And I think figuring out whatever these minimum viable fields are is, is the way to figure out how to put those together in a tabular format. And then they can, they can just link to, um, they can just link to the, uh, the spatial data. Some of these are collected with similar to the app we just saw. Um, this is a public facing app. Um, we call it the Zero Trash app, where um, you, know, you have like a little set of instructions. These basically align with OVTA pro protocols, telling users, well, what area are you actually surveying? Um, and then a super simple way to just you know, say, okay, the trash I see will fill a pie tin or a, a shoe box or a five gallon bucket or something bigger than that. And that corresponds to those OVDA categories. So some of these are collected with that app, but most are with the collector app because 
the advantage is that, is that you get to stream these lines as you go. So it's a lot quicker. You don't have to just put down those, uh, those uh, points. But this is what it looks like in tabular form. And as we, we can probably get onto this later, but as we were talking, I couldn't help myself. So I started trying to draft what the, uh, what like the minimum viable field data dictionary might be. It's sort of right. focused on these survey type data. I'll, I'll share a link to this in the, in the chat. Um, but these, this is the way I think we might be able to divide it up, right? Where these fields that we see here, these are ones that are common to any type of survey we would do latitude, longitude, survey date, the personnel, the geometry, right? The area or the length associated with that survey, the organization is associated with what field protocol was used, OVTA, ETAP, KCB, KAB, Caltrans, SFEIs, what, what sort of the environment that the survey was done in? Was it a riparian zone? Was it a road? Was it a parcel? Was it a beach? Um, and then, but the, the tricky part I think is like this um, survey type. Is it a fixed location that you're going back to and doing measurements over and over again? Or is it like the data that I just showed where you're just you know, driving or walking around all over the place? It's sort of an, an ephemeral, ephemeral sort of site. And if those types of fields are common to everybody, including the data that I just showed, um, well, these ones, like these would be only just those qualitative survey data. And then like we just saw with the material and the count item type item, that would be, that would be those count type data. Those would be stored off in, in separate tables um, that are connected to this table, say by a, a, a survey ID. And you would just have a way to connect those. And you'd have your control vocabularies that correspond with say, say wins tracks taxonomy, right? Item, item types and, um, and material yeah. types could correspond with that. I love this, man. Well, well done. You just whipped this up in like 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, no guys, as you guys were talking, it was, I couldn't help it. It was just giving me ideas. So I started, <laughs> and, I, and then I started, I couldn't stop. I started making all the lookup tables as we went. Um, so anyway, that is how I think we can get from, you know, like our system here that's special. It's just how it worked for us to create it. All these different, you know, apps that we're kind of all using now into what we were talking about at the very beginning. What's, and obviously like I'll share this link and like if there's a way that we can kind of pound out what the structure and those fields and the definitions should be, um, that would be a step that direction, I think. And people that build the, these apps like us and store data the way we're storing it here, um, that, you know, it doesn't per, per, totally serve our objectives because we want to get right all the way to like the, like the compliance type maps that you guys saw yesterday, right? To be able to tell those stories of like how much, how much area is getting less trashy, but it's more amenable to doing what anybody would want to do with the data. If they want to look at their hot spots, if they want to, um, you know, try to track changes over time by putting different data sets together, all that stuff. I think that's how we might get there. See some hand raised, hands raised. Uh, Andrea, I think you were first. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just a general question, if you, this is really cool. Uh, Gary, if you can go back uh, sharing screen on the map. So yeah. I'm not an expert on ESRI or ArcGIS. Uh, I just wanted to, and probably you already explained it before, but what will be the difference between using uh, ESRI one, two, three, and the benefit of using a collector instead? Yeah, the, the main difference, Andrea, is just the, um, the ability to stream as you go is, is what we found. You can store the same kind of data. It's just with the collector, you need, you need an ArcGIS license. So it's mostly city staff that are collecting these data or ourselves. So you can click, okay, I'm in a segment that's low litter condition. You're going, you're going, you're going, and then things change and you can just click a button on the app um, to change the condition. So it's, so it's just faster to use. 
Um, otherwise, you, 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 that a lot of these points are collected using the other one, the, the uh, Zero Trash app, because it's just, just points. But it is associated with that area, right? That um, thousand square foot area, each sure. of those points. And the other question is to create this map on the screen, is this an ESRI, kind of like an external ESRI uh, app, or is just an app that you created specifically for uh, your project? Yeah, this is it's using it's using some it's using some of the ArcGIS Online um, features. We were using PostGIS, the open source version, exclusively, um, and that but the data got so big that. Um, using the Esri products ended up being much faster to be able to render these data quickly. And so, so that's what we're, we're using now. But yeah, it's an application that we built to pull in these data and display and, and filter them this way. It's, this is being used by cities throughout the Central Coast in, in California now for their trash data. Okay, it, thanks. Sure. Charma, I think you were next. Thanks. Um, I had a couple questions about um, the map first. Uh, what happens if there's an area? Were you, was that what you were saying? Collect couldn't handle and display areas, but uh, the other app doesn't show areas? Well, the, the idea is that you, we deal with it through kind of the training where if you, because we wanted, we wanted the, the point data collected by people without an ArcGIS license to correspond with the OVTA data, we just deal with it through kind of the education here on the app saying like, okay, in, doing, in putting this point down, the survey that should correspond to this sort of area that you're looking at. And so that, would be important to be captured in the in the tabular data, I think as well. There's some overlap there because you're saying I'm using the OVTA say field protocol, mm -hmm. and in the photo protocol it specifies the area you're supposed to be looking at. But that seems like a fundamental enough piece of information that um, that you'd want to actually store that in the tabular data as well. Right. But to get to what it looked like you were showing the tabular data, it had a length, um, but didn't have another attribute. Um, yeah, yeah, these these are all just lines. So the, the raw data are just lines because you're collecting, you're streaming as you go. So you just know how long that feature is. And it so we don't actually get to, um, area until we get to like interpolate because you're just a line on the road and then you have to interpolate that area out to your adjacent parcels so that's like some spatial processing that happens after the raw data and then you actually get those areas yeah i guess i was just meaning like parking lots and things yeah so th that's what some of those points are is like if you're on the road and then you jump over into a parcel to do a parking lot survey, oh, okay. that actually correspond to that thousand square foot area because that's what our- Okay, yeah, I was misunderstanding the, the point there. I thought they were just associated with the line. Got it, thank you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and then is the object ID associated with the polygon in the tabular data? Or not the yeah, polygon, e the line? either one. There's actually two tables here. There's a there's lines and points, and so that ID is associated with which whichever of those those features. You and you could you could do a polygon also if you, if you wanted. And um, your your list of fields is um, pretty exciting. Can't wait to get into those um, once we look at all the data. Cool. I'll I'll put a link in in the chat, and at least it could start our wheels turning. Mm -hmm. Julian, you had your hand up. Oh, I, I actually had the same question about Jarma about polygons, but um, I'll just ask another quick one. I just noticed that some differences in the condition between some of the points and the polylines, like some were some points were purple on a yellow road. Is that just timing, or what? What is that? 
Yeah, so that's, um, well, we're looking, we're looking at assessments that go all the way from through the summer, from May up till now. So some of those are just different time periods. They're just kind of laid down on, and you can even see probably lines that overlap each other mm. on here also, right? Mm. See there's a green one on top of a yellow mm. one. Yeah. So some of those are just, they were collected at different times, but what, let's see, let's check this one. So that was 1021, this one's 525. That makes sense, okay. But the other thing that can happen sometimes when you're doing the surveys is you jump jump out over to a part, you're like on the road, and then you jump over to a parcel, and like you see a pile of trash there and put a point down there. And to use both those data, laying that raster grid down on, on top of it, you, if you area or length weight, those two different types of data, you can get an overall value for the grid cell using both those, both those data. German, did you mean to have your hand up? I really thought I put it down this time, but sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, very cool. cool, Gary. Yeah, should we should we uh, jump into your your proposal for the fields, and then we go through these with yours and Jarma's or in Julian's data set and see if it makes sense. Did, did we have any other data sets that we had two others? Uh, we did have two others, but we only have 15 minutes left. And um, I don't know, was there anybody else that uh, had shared a data set or brought a data set today that they would like to present? I guess that's the main, that's gonna be the main thing because that'll be the most useful um, use of our time, I think, if somebody's here to present the data. Um, well, I added a file. It's not too hard to understand. Um, okay. I don't know if it needs going over. Um, Which one is it? It's data for C10. Um, and this is really high level, right? So it's really more of the information that gets conveyed by the data that's gathered, right? From uh, in a similar way to um, what was just talked about by Gary, um, you know, there's there's all these points, and then you're gonna put that all into a picture to convey. Um, so this is for the region two phase one permit area. Um, this is, oh yeah, okay. So the colors are a little off, but because <laughs> the area converted to low is actually uh, colored red right now by the chart. But so this is the current, or as of 2019, um, the current status, I guess, of, of trash controls. So if you go to the other tab on baseline, you might see, and scroll it, yeah. And so that was the totality of trash generating acres as of, I think, 2009-ish, um, basically. And then if you go to current, you can see, you know, kind of how much work has been done. Um, so we don't need to spend a whole lot of time on it because um, I think it's kind of, you know, self-explanatory. So you, you look at, you know, how much acreage was at say very high and then if that got dropped down to high or medium or ideally low right and then you know that's how our permittees add up their their compliance uh, to demonstrate right. their trash reductions so that's all yeah and I, I guess it's just sort of a picture of of what you see at the end <clears throat> of your diagram right thanks thank you yeah that's really helpful because also i think the big a big question is like well whatever format we make the data in you better be able to get this out of it <laughs> right <laughs> like that's kind of a an ultimate uh well, objective I, feel like, of the data. I mean yeah. i feel like this is one use for it yeah right 
um, you're, we're collect, like people are going to be collecting trash data for a variety of reasons. One of those reasons is to demonstrate compliance with right. trash reduction requirements um, in their permits. Um, another reason that someone's collecting trash data might be completely different, you know, so. Right. What was the M H? Oh, sorry. H so that is medium high, very high. So if you were to just, you know, add the, you know, column from medium high and very high, which is what we, you know, care about the most when we're thinking about controlling for trash, um, that's that's kind of the remaining acreage. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, kind of what you can see here is that the cities with the largest, you know, acreages of right of way um, have a large amount of trash still to control, but also have controlled the most trash out of everybody. Um, is, you know, kind of the one of the stories. Yeah, so I, I think what we would need to get there, to get here, um, you know, if we store the score, that that's good, um, is to store the acres and then figure out what's acceptable for the the city or the permittee. If if we can assume that people can make that conversion from where their location is to their city or their boundary area. So that's something, yeah, I'm just sorry, kind of thinking out loud to go when we get down to Gary's list of fields, yeah. how much um, work we're expecting the consumers to do to make something like, like this out of it. Yeah, I mean, this is, so, I mean, this is a compilation of data that we did at our agency of, 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 the the compliance data that was submitted to us kind of in mm -hmm. in charge so there's even in so there was a step that was done by the permittees which is you know probably the biggest one which is to take these points um and and turn it into um a, another step of data that communicates you know how these points represent an area of land improving um and then from, from, you know, and then that was, that's what's reported to us. And then we take that chunk and, you know, this is for a very high level, this is used for very high level communication, right? Like to the public, the board mm -hmm. management, like, okay, here's, here's what's left essentially to do. And also here's how much has been done. Um, so, and, and I, I think, you know, to, yesterday and today's conversation has really helped me, thank you everyone, um, to kind of uh, see, you know, certain pieces that um, I feel like, I guess I took for granted as far as how, how you have to get the steps to get that all together. Yeah, this is this is interesting, Joseph. Um, as a as a use case, as an application of all these data, um, I, I'm. Can you just say quickly how how all of these permittees got their data to you? Not like how they came up with the numbers, but what is the mechanism for collecting all these data at the regional level? Uh, is it part of their yeah, reporting? Their permit. It is. It is. Mm -hmm. um, so in the permit, um, yeah. so there's a couple of steps that happen. And I'm sorry, uh, over lunch or something, I'll, I'll put in another table. So uh, basically each permittee is going to divide their entire jurisdiction into land areas. And most of them actually, most of your jurisdiction is gonna be low naturally because it's gonna be single family residential or something like that, right? So you just call that area, you just name that area one thing and there's Okay, now, now that's off the table and you go and then you divide your remaining jurisdiction into, well, 
they would divide their remaining jurisdiction into trash management areas. And then um, what we see um, Gary do with second nature and stuff is you're gonna go out and survey those areas. So you're gonna take a representative sample of sites within a trash management area and you're gonna perform, I believe it's, you know, ideally six OVTAs if you're trying to um, demonstrate a change from, you know, into a lower category. And, and those OVTAs in a year are going to be deemed to be representative of that trash management area. And then that gets repeated. And so it's, it's randomized within a trash management area where, where it is that you're going to pick to do your survey. And then those surveys added up represent your trash, that particular trash management area. Sorry, I, I'm probably bungling that <laughs> a, a bit on the explanation. Um, no, I, I just hadn't heard that 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 it was it was that these permits were that prescriptive in the in, in how they have to come up with this these total areas, um, and then those total areas have to be reported to the to the region. Do you or anybody else know if that reporting is also happening at the state level? The state is well. You know, I don't, the, that permit is still in the draft form and I'm not sure, you know, exactly what's going to come out as far as what the kind of compliance demonstration is going to look like. Um, that, sorry, if anyone wants to, if anyone knows uh, a little bit better. I was just asking for clarification from Julian sure. if he meant um, like the state level being like the phase to general permit or what? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I just wasn't yeah. clear. So, um, our phase one permit uh, is works a little bit differently currently, at least as far as I know. Which huge grain of salt, right? I'm just a yeah. stupid new guy. Okay, so don't. <laughs> um, you know, this um, phase one permit um, has a multiple multiplicative factor on very high and high trash generating areas. So mm -hmm. your acreage of high is going to be multiplied by 12 and the acreage of, or excuse me, the acreage of very high is gonna be multiplied by 12 and the acreage of high has a multiple, has a factor, of, is multiplied by a factor of four, sorry. Um, so if you can, and, and then, you add up the acreage of 12x times your very high, 4x times your high, 1x times your moderate, and that's your total um, percentage of trash generating, trash generating area that you would need to control. And then you would, and then so, and that's how, you know, if you were to have, say, you know, one acre of very high and you know a uh, few acres of, of high and a few acres of, of moderate such that the whole thing is like a uh, hundred acres and you controlled your one acre of a very high first that would be 12 percent compliance kind of mm. thing ah. it, the last that i saw it was going to be just that there's no multiplicative factor it's it was just you're gonna look at your PLU and control a percentage of that PLU uh, every year on your way to 2030. So all trash sharing areas is treated essentially equally. Gary, I know you've had your hand up for a little while. Oh, uh, just, I think that um, this is one of the dimensions of this problem that we have to wrestle with today, to what degree, right, because products like this, synthesized up products from the raw data, they're kind of just more useful, right? This is a more useful thing, just like the maps I was showing for knowing where we are, where we're going, but there's a lot underneath here, right? It's those raw data interpolated out to the parcels, so if you surveyed on a road, and what 
what's right next to you is an airport, you get a whole bunch of area in that category. And then the application of um, the, the, the sampling, right, in each of these cities, well, there's different numbers of sampling. You could have varying levels of representativeness across land uses and across cities. All that's embedded in this kind of data, data product. And so that's part of what makes, you know, storing this type of output in perpetuity um, more, more difficult, right? Because you, it, it's often difficult to trace back to all of those decisions that were made uh, along the way. And so it's, yeah, I, I think to some degree, we're gonna have to hedge toward um, the, the raw data just, just because of that, uh, of that problem. But even, even though these things are obviously much more useful to, to look at in the same way, a list of water bodies on the 303D list is more useful for most people than a, right, an entire table from the CDEN database, but there's a lot behind how that list got created. Both would be great. Totally. I mean, I have no idea how the, like, you know, what this, like, I just was submitting this as like, hey, I'm, I'm like, kind of like the end, end of the line. And, you know, this is what I see. So I don't, you know, I'm, I don't mean to derail the discussion because I don't know that this belongs, um, like you said. In no, this is totally relevant because this is, if this is the target output, we, right, it ha the way in which the data are, are stored, we have to make sure that it can get to this target output that people are going to use, right? So I think it's absolutely totally relevant, Joseph. Yeah, this is super useful. I think this is, this should be, um, I think that we'll want to break for lunch pretty soon, um, but people can stick around to have conversations if they want. We'll come back here at, at one o'clock. Um, but uh, I think we should, when we come back, we should uh, jump on that, that proposal that Gary made. And one of the major things we check is to make sure that we can, we think we can get something like this out of it. Um, if we ended up putting Julian and Gary's data sets into there. Um, so, yeah, but okay. feel free to stick around or you can come back to this room. You can also um, just, you know, mute yourself and, and come back on in an hour or whatever you'd like. Um, and whoever wants to stick around can stick around and keep chatting. And please think of uh, food-related puns while you're <laughs> chewing on your lunch. Yeah. yeah. Those will be welcome afterwards. But I think this was a great segue to back to the uh, that minimum viable field list and thinking about what the goal should be, um, you know, whether it's for compliance or for maximum use or for this idea of regional aggregation, like let's education that and outreach to get you know, um, public involvement, you know, yeah. like here's, um, so yeah. Cool. I should ask All too, right. was there any, was there anybody who shared a data set that they did want to add to the discussion? I just realized technically we got, we were supposed to go until 12.15, but I just dismissed it once, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> gone rogue <laughs> you know i'm not surprised when <laughs> too late i'm already gone <laughs> <laughs> you know i was looking at the san diego data set even though we didn't have a interpreter for yeah. us um one thing you know they have bags of trash it seems like that's their their main measure, um, but they do have a category, which I don't know. We know how big that bag of trash is, right? Like, is it a 30 gallon trash bag, 40 gallon trash bag? Yeah, you it's not, not too precise, that's true. But maybe, maybe in their data dictionary or their uh, procedures, they describe that. Um, uh, that, but the category is something I don't think we 
capture anywhere um, and, or that we've talked about. And I think to me, I, I was a little, I was a little sad that no one was here to talk about this data set because this is um, river trash, right? Not, this is um, on the banks, right? This is not on the street level. And all of the trash data that we had been talking about previously, I think today is, you know, street level, what are you trying to prevent, right? And then, you know, this data set is what either made it there through the MS4 or was directly deposited there or was windblown there or, you know, however it got to the edge of this river now, it's there now. So um, I was interested to hear about what, you know, what, what was being, you know, collected and the type of information that's in data being collected in, at the edge, I guess, of the receiving water, possibly in the receiving water. Yeah. That's the San Diego River trash? Yeah. Data set? Yeah. OK. We could ask Sarah to come from the other breakout room. Is she who shared that one? I mean, she's she works for the the uh, main community science group that collects and the data from there and rehomes the encampments there, helps with the encampments, and touts that it's like the main success. It's cleaning up that river, at least the main stretch of it. Sarah Hutmacher. Yeah. I think it'd be great to get her perspective too, because they, you know, they're collecting data for different purposes and they have the whole encampment outreach yeah, angle I mean, too. And the difficulty with those, the just cleanups in general that are collected, you know, on the, at the receiving water, whether that be a river um, or even the coastal cleanups is, you know, you walk a fine line when especially when you're dealing with volunteers, what you can ask of somebody to, to provide this form of data. You know, they're already volunteering their time and their effort to clean up the trash, like how much to expect from them. Um, and obviously we want a better granularity, but there's always a little bit of pushback from the organizers. Well, we can't really ask that from them or you know, provide field, having field sheets and stuff like that is sometimes a bridge too far even. So it's been a, it's oh. been a difficult dance sometimes, um, yeah. at least in my experience. And take the fun out of it <laughs> yeah right well sure it, it's just like one other piece of information and it's similar I, I was working with cal recycle and their um their illegal dumping which is different but similar where they're you know they're focused more on just illegal dumping sites and trying to figure out you know get them to try to provide data but that's a little bit better than maybe tonnage or just yeah bags and they again what size bags or what what types of containers they're filling or you know in how many couches you know stuff like that or mattresses it's just and they're just like well we can't it's, we're, we're barely scraping enough resource together to clean it up let alone try to find uh, information and my point has always been well if you get that kind of granularity to help show the data and show the supervisors or the cities that you know a uh, quantitative change in what you're doing that could help lead to better resources so and they're starting to listen it's just um it's just a difficult dance mm -hmm. Yeah, but I yeah, mean, I we can know. ask Sarah. It's interesting. the The Clean California grant is like the biggest funding I've seen in my entire life for trash, but there's no data collection, like required as part of that. It's very simple, you know. Just like, where are you? What? When are you doing something? What? What's some like big? information about what you're doing that's it and then they're also i also haven't been able to get through to them to uh have a discussion about research or you know looking for collaborations and things like that so so i, I realize that they're super busy but i don't know nick if you have some connections in that but that seems like a really big opportunity that we we might miss if we don't hop on it in the next couple months yeah, the um, well, she, the, Michelle talked about it this morning, but um, so she's one, but she's more of a kind of a marketing person. But Walter, Walter, you, it's his new position is directly um, 
you know, is very influential, I feel like, and he can help um, in many ways. Um, but I'm, yeah, we're all for <laughs> just making it, if you have all that, and I agree, that's the biggest influence of, or influx of, of funds that I've seen um, in a long time that's outside of tobacco, um, right. where we're, you know, there's a real opportunity there. Yeah. Um, but I say we, I mean, Sarah's, I mean, the other breakout room is just four people. I could jump over there and see if she, do you want to talk to the larger group or uh, like after or the smaller group or what? Oh yeah. If, I mean, maybe, yeah, maybe after okay. when, when we all come back together, we could say something. I could try to see if she wants to jump on. Yeah. Um, if she's available before four because I, I think we're not coming going back to the big group until the wrap up so yeah we wanted to inform ourselves before do we, do we know who made this data set though joseph you it seemed like maybe you knew who who created this data set river i do not know oh, yeah. i was hoping to hear more about it just because I see. Yeah. It, you know discussions on right you know uh, receiving water trash monitoring, right? Mm -hmm. Or to the me, that's set? that's Sorry. the. I I put a link in the oh, chat, okay. you guys. Salinas is a phase one. They have riparian trash data collection requirements too, um, and so I put a link in the chat of the data stuff we've been working on them with. It's essentially just a. I think the San Diego one is a bit different, so it'd be better to hear from Sarah. I think I think there's some more count item type data in what they're collecting from what I remember and she talked about it before. And the one that I just shared is more just an adaptation of the qualitative road-based surveys that you can just apply in the, in the riparian zone. So I think that whatever struggles we're talking about in terms of putting these data together will probably, I think it'll be similar, right? From riparian zones, beaches, to to roads if we solve it in one of those venues i think we'll we'll have cracked a lot of the problem for solving it for everywhere are people going to be using this kind of data for trash amendment complaints do you know maybe like phase, phase one cities it's required in their permit like salinas oh. the link i just shared they have they okay. have to submit this data it's part of their requirement and like joseph you're talking about or somebody was coming or Julian, I think commented on like whether or not yeah. you know people are required to submit this data. Region two is sort of way ahead of the curve of everybody, yeah. is my understanding, in, in the requirement to actually submit the data to measure the the progress. But I'm assuming other regions will have, you know, be coming soon. There's all, also Southern California, right? City of Santa Monica has had a TMDL for debris for longer than the trash amendments have existed. And they, in 2019, they actually did a little comparison between their debris TMDL and the trash amendments. And they decided we're going to stick with the debris TMDL because, well, it's a little more stringent in, compared to the trash amendments. And so that, you know, that's in those, um, those data are in their permit requirements as well. So as you'd expect, right? Los Angeles, San Francisco are sort of we you know, uh, on the edge of the curve. So we, yeah, we, you know, when we, we looked at the trash amendments to fit and, you know, we looked at our region's approach to um, trash prevention and we were like, okay, it's, we have a really uh, track 2E approach. Um, <laughs> so, we're going to keep going with that. Um, and it's, you, you know, like our approach satisfies the track two requirements and then, you know, kind of goes a little bit further perhaps. Um, so we were like, yeah, okay, we'll stick with that and we're, we're good. Um, yeah, but I, I would just, you know, I am interested um, in, kind of receiving water trash monitoring, um, the the way that that data could be used um, because, and, and, you know, how hard it is to get, um, mm. 
you know, so I, I don't want to take up everybody's lunch because <laughs> the, the discussion could go on and on. But, you know, I think one of the problems that, that I felt like, um, and this is, this is all personal opinion, right? But I felt like with qualitative uh, trash assessments, you got some information, but it would be, uh, it was so fuzzy um, that it would be hard to tell. It could be potentially hard to tell um, with just the like visual assessment if you're moving the needle in the receiving water body. Like there, I mean, you could have an assessment that showed you know 250 gallons of trash per acre and you and then another assessment at at a site that was 100 gallons of trash per acre and they come up with the same score you know and then to me that was i'm like there's that's so much that's such a big difference in the amount of trash there and you could you could be on the right track and your, your assessment might not be showing you that you're on the right track as far as reducing trash and receiving water. And you might, you might end up in a situation where you're like, well, eh, are we even making any headway? And you lose, you, you know, you might lose the faith or something. Uh, you know, I don't know how to say it, but it's like, you need, you would be stuck in a situation of trying to convince people, no, we're going to keep doing this. It's working, I swear. And, and what's behind that is, you know, this same number, like A, B, C, D, or one, two, three, four, whatever it is. And it's like, it's still a two. It's like, yeah, but we're, we're almost to a one, I swear. <laughs> yeah. And then did not have, you know, and not have the backup to continue to get the resources that are solving the problem or, or to demonstrate that you're moving the needle. So there's yeah i think i mean those are, they're all great point go ahead Jarma. i was just gonna say at least go one to ten so you can make those little incremental changes instead of just one to four that gives you big buckets go ahead i was gonna say i mean these are other they're all great points joseph I, I would say that you know i think that the, the the points that you're bringing up were directly led to you know that trash monitoring playbook that came out of of the funding from Squirp and SFEI and, and OPC. And I'm hoping that, I mean, that just came out relatively, not, not that long ago, but I'm hoping that, that the whole point of that was to establish real methods. I mean, there was really no established method or consistent methodology for even trying to do this and measure it with um, any sort of consistency. And, you know, that dense, then you have all these problems. Like, how do you know that the 250 and the 100 were even comparable or collected in the same way? And were they even accurate? So um, I'm hoping that with as that kind of gets rolled out more broadly and 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 you know publicized and utilized that that can hopefully open those doors and make it more measurable and quanti quantitative versus qualitative because you're right I mean this is um, when I was doing the assessment like the water quality assessment for 303D listing and trash like it was a really impossible task to do because you couldn't find a consistent method there was the region two rapid assessment but even that has issues but um so just having these methods now that are available i think is was a huge first step and that was the necessary thing to do before we could kind of move, move forward but i think hopefully you know as that kind of gets legs and people start seeing the value and in, in utilizing those the data will improve and then we can make start making some some analysis based on that data yeah the, the good thing is that we have a bunch of data now collected for like, you know, three, four years for lots of places. And so at the outset, the, the sort of we're, what we're talking about is an experimental design, right? Is the experimental design adequate to test that substantive hypothesis of interest, right? That is underneath the management question. Are we making progress? Do, do, do the data have the statistical power to measure a change from one time to another? Are they unique enough to, are they those categories, they separate enough that you can measure the difference from one location to another? And, you know, that largely has to do with the number of times you look and the amount of variance in the data, just like 303D listing, right? It's not just count all the observations, you use a specific statistical test based on a particular distribution to determine whether or not um, something something is listed or not. And that's what we just didn't have the benefit of, I think, at the outset in development of these methods. And we're, we're in a much better position now 
to try to inform those experimental designs because we have those data. We can look at what the, the local variance is and determine, well, gosh, it's, how difficult is it gonna be over a two year span to be able to detect that change, right? Because that's what we actually need to know. That's where, where, the, where the rubber meets the road. And it's sort of a middle ground, you know? It's just like, you know, measuring a change at an outfall is greater assurance of some good things being done in the urban catchment, better assurance than a list of stuff that the permittee did, but it's probably easier to detect than a change in the receiving water. Similarly, measuring trash loading in receiving waters, it's even harder to detect a change than where we're, so we're kind of, it, and I think it's the right place, you know, we're, we're, we're doing the Buddhist way here. We're taking the middle path, right? This is something that's verifiable. It's, it's pretty connected to something we're measuring a direct impact on the resource. It's not the hardest thing to measure. It's the, not the most directly connected, but it's better than just, you know, a list of stuff that, that, that they did. We just have to keep doing the experiments to see. And we've done a, a bit of that. The last, the last um, paper that we published, we did that analysis to look at like, what's, what's our capacity to detect those changes over time and um, spatial, spatial patterns based on three years worth of, of data collection. It tells you something about the density in time and space you probably want to incorporate into that ex experimental design to be able to do that in the future. Yeah, it'll be interesting to hear. I, I've been thinking about this, Julian, for your data set, you know, how do you see that? Because that's much more quantitative. You know, you're actually going out and counting every piece of trash. Do you see that being converted into OVTA scores? Or it sh should, should you just look at the counts and see how those change? Um, I don't know if Christine is here, um, but she might have an opinion about that. Christine Flowers has been using this collector for uh, uh, a number of years, and Cecile Carson, who I think is with her, actually. Um, but I think I think they've identified some conversion factors, like number of pieces and how that converts to an OVTA. But um, but I think it's also pretty. Well, I I don't, don't want to say it's super quick to train someone on how to do it do OVTA, but. Um, but it is possible, and part of what I think we we should expect of these data is that the it includes an OVTA which has been, uh, you know, quality assured through training, and that it's reliable. Um, so the um, yeah, but there might also be ways to to convert or just look at those relationships in the data between counts and scores. Yeah, Joseph, you were here. Yeah, kind of to follow up on what Julian said, I think that's kind of like the golden ticket as far as um, efficiency with receiving water trash monitoring goes is, you know, can we establish that relationship between the quantitative and the qualitative, like really, really effectively? right like you know if if the qualitative score was this then you know the the count would would have been you know kind of plus or minus you know something like that i don't know that it's possible to do but that would be uh sweet <laughs> as far as trash receiving water monitoring because it would it would enable us to get a lot of data and it would enable us to have a better picture of what that means for trash flowing in the receiving water and the, the quantity of, of trash that that OVTA, you know, the rivering over OVTA kind of represents, you know? I think, I don't think we're there yet, um, but, I think, just I think those factors that you mentioned that are applied to the areas in different categories, I, I think I remember that those are intended to, because like the OVTA does have numbers associated, right? They're like loading numbers. 
And the spacings between those factors sort of correspond to the spacings between the loading numbers in the development of OVTA, but it gets you to sort of just a metric that's not a loading value of, of volume. So it's sort of hedging. It, it seems like it's sort of just, I don't, I don't know if you, is that sort of what you're talking about, getting to an actual volume, getting into the receiving volume? Right. I mean, like, because, you know, as far as using the OVTA on a city street, um, I feel like there's so much less variables, right? Because it's a trash you can see, and it's it, it's flat with one right angle, you know. <laughs> and so the the trash on the street is you're gonna be able to see almost for sure every piece of trash if you're paying attention, right? When you get down into uh, a receiving water. Uh, a shoreline or a creek bank or you know whatever it is that there are so many more variables in there that you know are gonna that affect your ability to see the trash and score the site and um you know and then there's another layer of you know if you're looking at some place that may receive trash and this i mean i could be wrong Right, but if you're looking at some place that may receive trash from, you know, illegal dumping or or encampment or something like that, there's there's more larger items which are kind of easier to see, and that that kind of helps you also identify the smaller items, right? So if you have that mix of small trash and large trash when you're in there looking for it, I feel like the larger trash would help kind of assist you to score that as you know potentially trashier um and if there's an area that's being affected by more distributed trash or that's not really receiving any kind of direct discharges then those you, you know i'm concerned that it's smaller bits of less noticeable trash and so if you're using a visual assessment method to to look at a, a, a edge of a receiving water in in that manner then you know does that does that end up getting a lower score because there's no corresponding like larger piece of trash to to influence your perception um and then i think um the the final kind of question that I have and I don't know how answerable it is is what does the level of trash on the bank like what you you can view the level of trash that's not in the receiving water how does that correspond to what was flowing you know through the creek when it was high water so that's yeah all super hard questions like and, and super thing super difficult things to answer yeah we I mean, we struggle with that same thing, just the fact that like, there's so much that goes into how clumped the trash is. And so we, our answer was to try to, but we had the OVTA, that was what was created. That was, so it's like, that was our starting point, but we tried to calibrate ourselves by, you know, when we first started training people to do it, we just collected all the trash. We just collected all the trash in that segment so that our categorical, assessment now was directly tied to not just a loading number that was basically an experiment performed in a location a long time ago, but what you can actually observe, right? You can verify, it. you can collect all that trash, you gave it a certain category and figure out like, oh, I call that moderate, but there's only enough trash here for this to be in low or whatever, or high and moderate, just to try to put a check on some of that subjectivity that just it, it just happens. There's overlap between those categories. When you're in the low and moderate, I feel like it's really tough. People like you definitely get like two observers that all mark one or the other, and it makes a big difference for compliance. It, it, it that's and that was kind of the thing that we saw in our region as well. It was like, you know, you it's almost like there was two categories that you could be sure of, right? If it was low or moderate scored, then it was most likely definitely one of those two right you could be sure it wasn't high and if it was high or very high it was it was definitely one of those two high or very high it wasn't it was 
certainly not moderate or low. And it, it's almost like, um, yeah, you get, it's a one or a two instead of a, like a one, two, three, four kind of thing. And that's definitely it's like, just, yeah. it gets back to that granularity question we were talking about before, right? Like John was saying, like slice it up into 10 categories. So the last analysis we did using those machine learning outputs, which it's detecting pixels, right? Which pixels are trapped? So it's slicing it way finer. And we did a comparison and looked, okay, you just use the categories to try to and you know pick up all the trash on the segment. Well, how much variance in the trash volumes does that explain? With OVTA, you explain about 30% of the actual trash volume variance because you only have four categories, right? You, do, you don't have that much granularity. But with the machine learning based approach, because you've got like a, con a continuous scale of number of pixels that you can translate to the volume, that explains about 68% of the variance. So much more, still not, you know, you know, not stellar, but a lot more because you've just, and I think that's the main reason is that you've got that continuous scale that you, you know, you can have 12 pixels or 24 pixels or 87 pixels, not just those categories. And Google's going to solve it all for us. So <laughs> Google's going to count all the pixels for us. <laughs> I want to. I want to convince Google to do a uh, a nationwide assessment of trash on roads and how it's changed over the past like couple of years. Just like what the trash counts are per mile of road throughout, and like look at the average of that. Like, is that increasing, decreasing? I mean, we're hearing a lot of stories. Like you saw the Keep America Beautiful report recently. They said in the past 10 years, 50% reduction of litter on roads throughout the country. Yeah, that was, that was, but that was during 2020. I'm a little bit skeptical of whether or not that's representative of like a long-term trend or just like COVID. I don't know, but you know, that's just the skeptical science and scientists in me. Um, but it, it is, it is encouraging if that is, if that is true, that we're on a slow, steady decline. And um, I think Google data would tell us that. I mean, and then so so the piece of data that you would have to integrate with this, right? Because if you're using the trash you can see on the road to, you know, think about what trash is going to potentially be going to a water body, you'd also have to integrate the data about where trash capture devices are and what drainage areas they're controlling. Because, you know, we've gotten complaints at the agency, like, oh, there's all this trash. It's going to go to the bay. And I'm like, well, oh, no, actually... Um, that's, that drains to a large hydrodynamic separator. So it's ugly on the street, but it is, you know, it is not going to the bay. Um, and that's good, but yeah, I want to see it. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, we're, we're all the human beings that are in this society that's making this problem. Right. I mean, oh, definitely. I agree with that. <laughs> uh, I, I'm just surprised that it seems that there's a report I mean, that says it's going down when i mean you can go out and find 20 year old trash that's still out there so we're not getting rid of all of that so it just seems odd that we could be decreasing that seems just difficult to be able to answer that question at all it seems right it seems i don't know you'd wonder how 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 did they figure that out right what was the analysis and the data they used to figure well, that out it, that seems hard to do and did it just go from the roadway to now it's like really right. entrenched in something and, and you can't see it and it's there still. Cause that's the, that's the, the 20 year old trash that you might, that I would find, you know, find outside. It's now under some bushes and stuff, you don't see it. But once, you know, you go to pick up one piece and then you pick another piece and then now you're underneath the brush and finding this old like beer can from with the pop top instead of the. <laughs> yeah. And that, that's what's fascinating about Google getting into this game because it's like that, right? When we were talking about the machine learning based approaches and well, yeah, cars are gonna be in the way sometimes, right? So your data is messy, it's gonna be noisy. But guess what? If you get enough data, you can see through the Facebook data is messy, right? But how much mm -hmm. does Facebook know about us right. just because there's 
so much of that data. You could say the same thing about, well, I can't use Google Street View imagery to know what the proportion of red cars versus white cars are out there because some are in garages and some, sure, all that's true, but there's enough data that your sample is big enough that you're gonna be able to see through that noise. At it's, least the, you know, yeah, I think the trends will be accurate. The trends will be accurate. The like, it'll be correlated to the truth. It's going to be offset. We're going to be missing some trash is what we're saying, which like statistically is actually easier to deal with than if you were potentially missing and increasing trash a lot, because it's just a shift in the data set down. Yeah, we can right? experiment and correct for the bias that we know. Yeah. That we have, is it, okay, there's a known low bias in the Google data. Yeah. Correct it. Yeah, times two or something. Yeah, whatever uh, it is. Yeah. Jarm is skeptical. <laughs> no, it, it, I, I was just enjoying your guys' excitement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'll be fun. Maybe Gary and I need to pitch like a nature paper or something to them. <laughs> Who's in on it? Yeah. I'm trying to convince them. I'm like, I'll write the whole thing. Great. Sign Just me do up. this one simple analysis for me. <laughs> Sign me up. All right. Well, I think I'm gonna break for for lunch now that we're down to okay. half an hour. Great. Yeah, I guess we should take a break, huh? <laughs> yeah, it's fun talking about trash. Yeah. So you know, I was like, I was working with this guy who's lobbying um, congressional staffers for uh -huh. um, trying to figure out like like because there's these stormwater infrastructure bills and there's well not stormwater but infrastructure bills and also like extended producer responsibility for plastics and he's trying to figure out a way you can get actually get some stormwater money out of that and nice. he asked me like well how much trash is coming from cities and i was just like i don't know let me go see if i can find out do and people I, live in cities trash comes solely from people you, but you can't find that number. I was blown away. Oh, yeah. How much it's is? Not out, you, so you see this number repeat. I started drilling down. You see this number all the time. 80% of trash, right? You guys have seen that. 80% of trash comes from land-based sources. It's in no, it's in NPA. It's in the California Trash Amendment staff. 100% of trash comes from land-based sources. Is there any ocean-based manufacturing plant that well, I don't know well, about? You know what I mean? Fishing, like, gear, yeah. and shipping, and <laughs> stuff yeah. i don't know <laughs> but but you see this number and it all roads lead back i'm like i've got to figure you know like where does this come from right and all roads seem to lean back to this 1999 noah like glossy public outreach report I, uh, no data there's no scientific publication i cannot find anything to support that number and the, but you can kind of try to work it out i tried to do this because you have um, some loading estimates from Southern California, like Santa Monica TMDL has loading right. estimates in like pounds per acre per year. And you have like recent work tells you like what global trash loading, whatever it is, 12 million tons per year or something. And just multiply the loading from LA by the uh, impervious or, or developed coverage in the US and figure out, well, how about how much seems to be coming from the cities? Guess what it is? Huh. About 80%. <laughs> nice. So all that, that. that's the next a, a nature paper. <laughs> I can't believe it when it worked out that way. <laughs> oh man. That's that's funny. Yeah. I mean it like it makes it makes in, intuitional sense too. I think our number is always going to be a little fuzzy there, but <clears throat> I think there have been some recent studies where people have tried to constrain that number. I can't remember. It was, I, I, all I remember was that they were like, yeah, it's pretty much about 80% also. It might've been like 60 to 90 or something like that. I, I'd love to find them. Cause there was, you guys know the Sea Spiracy movie that came out recently? Uh, I've heard a lot about it, but. Uh, so my friends were telling me and they were telling me, well, all the trash is coming from the fishermen in the ocean. And I was just like, well, yeah. I don't know if yeah, that's, that's weird. true. <laughs> the trash on land too the trash on my roadside over here is coming from them <laughs> yeah i don't know i see people drinking out a lot of plastic bottles i mean well, what's sure what's the population that. of these fishermen like i mean you have to someone has to buy the trash first right <laughs> like it, right every time like right every piece of trash someone bought that 
yeah at some yeah. point so what's the economic buying power of these fishermen um out in the ocean that they're able to per like consume that much <laughs> well, they're saying it's like the nets and stuff is the idea it's the, the nets that get caught and stuff but yeah. I don't and then know. you reel in the net and it's full of trash. <laughs> it's it's not quite add enough for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a big disconnect. All right. I'm gonna head out and grab some lunch as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah me too, guys. Yeah. Nice talking with okay. you. See you guys in there.
Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Um, hey. so I think we should probably jump right in because I just saw an email that Sarah is joining us. Hi, Sarah. Um, and you only have a few minutes before you have to jump back over. Hi. So, hi. Do you um, want to just quickly introduce yourself and then I can, uh, uh, if you don't know, I can tell you why we requested your presence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We should do um, that. Hi everybody, I'm Sarah Hutmacher and I am the Chief Associate Director of the San Diego River Park Foundation. We're a, a nonprofit organization that uh, collects, well, among other things, does data collection about trash in the San Diego River. And we do data collection along about 15 and a half miles of the lower river with volunteers. Um, and that is visible on our data portal that has a map, but the data I exported is the table version of that map data. I'll plunk the map in the chat just in case, but I do not know why, what your question was. So um, so uh, I, I think you answered it. The the uh, well, you answered it for us. The there was a, a San Diego River trash data spreadsheet uh, submitted to our folder, and we wanted to know if that was you. And this is it. Yep. So um, we just want we were walking through other example data sets of how trash data are collected. So um, if you could give us a little spin of 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 what the what we're looking at, that'd be great. Sure. Um, so this is an export that I did, I think yesterday of what the point in time of the river uh, site condition looked like yesterday. So we update the data. Um, we do about eight segments of the river a week where the volunteers will go out and re-walk and re-survey um, half mile to up to two miles at a time. And those, it takes us about in the busy areas of the river where things are changing frequently, it takes us about three weeks to start recirculate, like to revisit sites that we have previously recorded to either take them off the map, um, change them to site no longer present or change any of the metadata associated with it, uh, something that has changed. Um, in some of the less dynamic areas, it takes us about six weeks. So like three to six weeks to revisit and update. We just did a big push in the beginning of October to update all of the data in a 10 day period. So pretty much everything on here has been updated since um, the first week of October. Um, and yeah, the so what this isn't is the historical data. Our nod to capturing any history is just in the comments. We will track if like something has been changed or if we reduced a bag count or if it went from active to inactive, we'll record that in the, in the um, comment section. Um, but we do this, we, I have a spreadsheet like this basically for every day since 2017. So we have a bonkers amount of this data, but it exists as a uh, single export spreadsheets. So, and uh, the map that I posted in the, chat is more what we use for advocacy. It's sort of a, just a visualization of this. And if you click around, you can see each of those icons on the map and it'll, and then we can add parcels and land ownership types so that people can kind of see what's going on in their particular parcels of the river. So um, super cool yeah. and incredible that you're able to uh, uh, refresh these data so quickly. It's amazing. Um, yeah, well, it's a lot of data. <laughs> yeah. One thing we've been talking about is the uh, as qualitative assessments like the on-land visual trash assessment. And you're working, you're working in the in the riparian area. Do you do you guys collect uh, any kind of qualitative scoring of what you see? So no, the, the only exception is the special removal needed. We have a, our own scoring system that's just sort of like, what do we mean by that? Does it just mean we need a shovel or does it mean we need like a tractor? Um, but everything else, we just use the um, volumetric information about how many bags. So that's a 42 gallon trash bag and our average trash bag is 35 pounds. So when we're doing a lot of the, because most of our um, stakeholders don't really know what 12 bags of trash means, we usually convert it to um, estimated pounds when we report out like, hey, Caltrans, you've got 
2,000 pounds of trash on your property. And is this being used currently for the trash amendments for any of the uh, reporting for that? Uh, not that I, no, I don't believe so. We do work really closely with um, the city. <clears throat> the city bases their environmental services cleanups on this data for the riverbed. Um, and Caltrans uses our data for cleanups. And then we also share all of the active encampment data with um, a homeless outreach partner who is under contract with the city of San Diego so that they can um, send all of their um, outreach you know, client resources to folks that are living in the riverbed so that we can, we actually go out with an outreach worker twice a week to help navigate them exactly to where the encampments are. So yeah, lots of landowners are using our data, but it's not part of the monitoring. I mean, you'll see pretty much everything we've got in here is downstream of any BMPs. <laughs> So it's all stuff that is in the riverbed and most of it is getting in there. It's not bypassing a BMP, but like, you know, it's, it's being carried by somebody that way. I see Gary's hand up. Yeah, Sarah, this is cool. I saw you present on this before um, and I was trying to remember, uh, I think it's a great example of like, it's oriented differently than some of the other data we're talking about. Essentially, you're talking about data that's immediately actionable. You're gonna go do something like tomorrow or next week. So you have to collect the information in a way that allows you to, to do that. Um, and what we've been talking about is like, okay, well, how do we get data sets like this to fit together with other types of data sets? And was, I didn't know what, what you just said, um, that you you actually do have a, a volume. A lot of the other data we're talking about are these, is these qualitative assessments, but they are um, sort of translatable to, to volumes. And so I think with like, a few a few tweaks um, that this I don't see like this is a good example of a data set. I don't see a reason why um, we wouldn't be able to make it fit together. And the, the question that I had for you is when you collect those volumes, do you know the area across which you're collecting that amount of volume? We don't record that information, but if it is um, greater than a, a 10, 25 foot diameter, we record it as a separate site. So if okay. any of it is, it, any one point might be a 25 foot, like, you know, big circle, but some of the sites, there are a couple of places in the riverbed where there's not active management, where there might be a hundred yards of trash, like just in a long line. And we don't have a great way of capturing that because it, it, it kind of clutters up the map to add like you know, a, an icon every 25 feet. Right. So there are, there's an example of that. If you guys, if you want to see an example, if you go to where the 805 freeway is, which is west of, um, west of that map. I don't know if I can share in your um, thing. I can show you really quick. I can try. Uh, yeah, I'm there. Um, if you go, this site for example um there's a, a button here that says north complex leftovers and then over here we have a site that says west edge of massive site so this one has only one bag because most of the trash is accounted for in the other um pin but it's an example of like there's basically just solid trash this entire section so that doesn't happen thankfully that often anymore so but we do have to do that once in a while, which is not, it's sort of an imperfect way for us to figure out how to do this. This is a federal property, by the way. <laughs> the, that's great. <laughs> um, the second question I, I had was, is there a field protocol that's documented that delineates all of these, these um, different elements you're describing now? I think so, kind of. We have a, a training that we have to do for all of our volunteers because they have to get their, uh, volumetric estimations calibrated with everybody else so that we have comparable data. Um, so I have a training that we do for like, especially it, a lot of it focuses on our standards for things that don't fit in a trash bag. Like what is our standard for our conversion for how many bags equals a queen size mattress and things like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I can do, you want, I can send over that training um, that would have probably most of it. 
Yeah, can you put the link in the chat? This meeting that we need to have kind of a protocol that's something that is suitable for what you guys are kind of looking for, and we haven't done that yet. But yeah, because kind of what we're going through is, is like, well, we can't capture everything in the database, but if you can get back to documentation that tells you, you know, some specific things, that sort of makes the data more more usable. Yeah, yeah that's great. I think the two things that cause noise in this data set for us that we see all the time is one, we don't know when we never pick up anything related to an active encampment. And so we don't know always how much, uh, if somebody, if there's an enforcement action and people are asked to leave or arrested or whatever happens where that camp becomes inactive, we have really no way of knowing how much trash is going to get left behind. So we attempt to estimate how much trash is going to be left behind, but sometimes people will clean up their own trash or like some of the stuff that we can't see on the inside of a tent. Like we don't know if it's trash or if it's like personal belongings that are of value. So that's one thing that I would say is like a known, we've, we've thought about like, should we do some like estimate it before it's active? And then again, when it's inactive and then try to come up with some sort of multiplier, but we haven't done that yet. And the other thing is we don't record anything that's less than a bag. So if we're out there and we find like one sweatshirt laying on the ground, we're not gonna record that. Uh, if we find like 25 cigarette butts, we're not gonna record that. So we only record things that are kind of in large volumes, but we remove about 300,000 pounds of trash a year from the river the, and the permittees do um, double that. So, I mean, we're talking about like a million pounds a year. So we're kind of at a coarse um, level of detail for some of this stuff, just because we don't, we're not focused on cigarette butts for the most part. <laughs> we'll get those while we're there. When That's we a mind bending amount of trash. <laughs> you could make a strong argument that removing that trash is a lot more important than how you collect the data. <laughs> that's, that's great. Cool. Thanks so much, Sarah. Yeah, no worries. And then you have to um, jump back to the other session, but. Um, yeah, yeah, really but I can, it. I'm always around. So I'll put my email in the chat in case anybody is just has questions later, but I've got all of you guys, I think, or at least some of you, so I can email over that um, training document. Cool. Cool. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. See you. See you. Thank you, Sarah. Year. All right. Wow. All right. So much going on. Lots to think about. <clears throat> um. I can get us all back on the same page and then we can kind of uh, start where we left off. I'll share my screen real quick. Um, so we were, before we left for lunch, which sorry for if I confused anybody with the timing, I thought it was supposed to be 12, but it was 12, 15, but anyways. Some people stayed around and we had some lively discussions about, we talked lots of trash. It was, it was really cool. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think we've, we've touched on a lot of these breakout group questions that, that we uh, wanted to during this time while we were diving into data uh, sets for the trash amendments. But um, the one last thing that we had on, the, on this was to get a minimum viable field list, which Gary um, has drafted a straw man for that. Um, and so maybe I'll pass it over to Gary in a minute here. And then um, <clears throat> the second thing was uh, something I'd really like to learn from this group is if anybody's had some real like breakthroughs and discoveries during their uh, data collection and analysis so far where they've learned that maybe certain, uh, certain actions don't work very well, certain, certain things do, um, you know, in terms of like how we can actually prevent trash from getting into the environment. Cause I think ultimately that's what track two's goal is. Um, and that's what we're measuring is how much trash is on the roadsides. It's like <laughs> the initial, the inception of trash getting into the environment in a lot of cases. Um, so yeah, so it's just really exciting. Um, but yeah, all, is that cool, Gary, if I pass it over to you, cause you kind of have that drafted already. Uh, sure, I can I can share my screen, um, and then there's a link in the chat. I'll put it there again. 
if folks want to look at it and everybody should be able to edit this. Um, so maybe in the notes column is the best. I'm not sure the best way to do this actually, if anybody has suggestions, because like, like when said, this is just a straw man that, you know, was coming up in my mind as, as we were talking through it as Right, what we're trying to do is hit this balance point between capture enough information that's going to be useful, um, but not so um, burdensome that makes it difficult for data to actually flow into whatever this centralized structure we're talking about is. And we also want it to be able to correspond with CDEN to some degree. So here's a, here's a first whack at this wherein the, the overarching concept is a trash survey. And, and feel free, everybody, interrupt me or say what you think about this. There's a trash survey, and that can be you're going out and you're going to do count data. You're doing um, large trash, like we just heard from Sarah, with primarily focus on homeless encampments. You're going to do an OVTA on a road. You're doing a qualitative assessment in a riparian zone. Whatever it is, it's some, you're going out to collect some type, a person is going to a place on a date to collect some type of trash data. So that's like the highest level concept. And so the information captured in kind of the main table, I've just called the survey table here, are on that level where we have lo location coordinates, a date, a location name, if, if you have one, um, what type of survey it is. I said this before, if it's like, it seemed pretty critical if like it's a place you're going back to all the time or like Sarah's data, you don't know where you're going to be. It's just a unique location. That latitude and longitude are gonna be 0 0.001 degrees away yep. from the last Gary, time you're in the area. Gary, I'm taking your um, suggestion and interrupting you um, about that field. Um, wh Which one? Why is that necessary? Yeah, um, I'm not sure it is. Okay. Well, <laughs> how about it? I, I guess I, I'm going to for the approach that let the data speak for themselves and that if you see this site multiple times, it's something that they um, people go back to multiple yeah. times. If you don't um, see it, then it's not um, because somebody could have the best intentions that they would go back there many times. So they'll put um, whatever that, that appropriate value is, but then maybe their funding gets cut. Maybe they, you know, whatever the, the program falls apart and that never happens. Or conversely, they think they're only going to go there once, but then next year they thought, oh, that's such a great spot. Let's go back. So I, um, yeah, it's perhaps not necessary. Thank you. The other reason in support of that argument, uh, Dharma, is like, well, if like this is not a required field, location name, if it's not like a site that you've made or something or a station, it's probably not gonna have a name. So that sort of informs that as well. So there's some overlap if you have this field also. But uh, why not force them to pick a name? Cause if it was, if it's something that you're going back to how are you going to find it again if you don't name it? I think that's especially important for like priority land uses. Like if it's a place you have to go back to the same spot every six months. I was, that's what I was going to say is, and, and again, it goes to how do you want to, how do people want to use this? Um, because, you know, I remember yesterday folks saying like, Hey, you know, you, by making all this data, you know, in this format, that's publicly accessible with no explanation, which may be needed in some cases, right? Someone may come and say, Hey, you know, there's, there's a compliance fault. So if we put a name like, oh, this is PLU AB1 or you know, whatever it is, uh, you, you know, or the this lat long is associated with PLU AB1, does it, <clears throat> does that cause a problem? Uh, you know, like, is it, would it, would this, would a permittee pull this data, you know, from CDEN to then you know, communicate that to the regulator or would the regulator pull this data because the permittee said, we've uploaded it, here you go. So I don't, so yes, there's a, you know, uh, argument for the name of the survey location. What, what kind of area are you continually going back to? But 
uh, I'll stop there. So I, I don't know the answer. I'm just <laughs> well, consideration. I mean, we could have it in there and not have it required, I guess, is the greatest flexibility. The, the reason I'm thinking is like, if you're just, you know, going along streets and you're going through it, you're not, you're certainly not going to, for each feature where you start and stop your assessment, you're probably not going to have a name if you're, you know, an entire city. Um, unless it's a fixed location and it's a sampling approach from the PLU, then yeah, you probably have a name for it, I think. Um, but it could be the street name one, the street name two, the street name three, as you go forward on the street. I mean, it doesn't have to be, you don't necessarily have to be able to have somebody else get to the point that you're talking about just by that name, but it should be unique. But there may be in one, you may have several thousands of those in a, in a data set is the, so as, if you're going, you, you know, you may, that's, that's, I guess this is one of those elements that is that overly burdensome to have people make up 3000 individual names for, uh, yeah, if they're not fixed sample sites. You're arguing that the lat, lat long should just speak for itself. Yeah. As to a certain extent, but I think this is where training really comes in is, is uh, if, if a, for, a, for a management purpose, a city needs to know which PLU is being referred to at this point, then that field does need to be filled in. Yeah, and it's it's almost like Joseph's point before. It's like, well, you know, how synthesized up do we go? Because somebody could take these data and put it in their GIS, and now they know what their PLU, their data were collected in. So it sounds like really the the question of whether the name of the survey location is required is is a separate issue as um, you know as to whether it's fixed or um, or the type, I guess it's called. So you could, you know, maybe in the notes there, um, talk and say, should this be required? Make that, well, yeah, yeah you have it no there, but maybe could it be. Um, I think perhaps another issue that uh, you would have with a site that you revisit is that maybe um, one of the 20 times you go revisit it, it's not quite the same, or each time you go revisit it, it's generally the same, but not quite. And how do we deal with that? Um, you know, in, in CEDA, we do, we do have that, like the a table that stores the um, target lat long and a table um, that stores the actual so you can have your site that you're supposed to be revisiting, but if you go out and you, you know, the water's higher that time and you have to go 20 feet up or whatever, um, you can record that. It doesn't, it's not easily uh, retrievable at the, the way that we have our output set up, but it's, it's there. So we, I mean, that could be a way to handle that problem. Julian, I just saw your email. I don't know how you wanted to fold that uh, presentation in? Do you think uh, it's a... I think we're kind of working through it right now. Okay. Yeah, I, I had created a little jam board just to Do get a sense of- we want to stop this at some stage? Well, I, I, isn't, I mean, this is going to be our, our product really. Yeah. Um, let's, yeah. This whole thing. Let's keep going. Yeah, I think we should just keep going. Keep okay. Going. Okay. My, my, uh, it was just a thought exercise. Um, can I suggest another field that's yeah. lo like location name, which is the, um, and sort of high up on the list, which is the, the permittee ID or name. Oh, yeah. Since Actually, I wrote organization, but that's different than permittee yeah. ID because an organization might be, well, yeah. that should be like the person collecting the data or something, right? Yeah. Which they might be the same, might be different, but here this might also be an optional one since, uh, well, I don't know, should it be required? If, if, if what we're talking about is a repository of data that is for permitting purposes, like it should be assigned to a permittee. Yeah. 
But is it, I mean, wouldn't we accept it, data from, wouldn't this database accept data from anyone? I think that's an open question. Like, like then it becomes a crowdsource um, situation where anybody can pick this up and report trash anywhere. And I don't know if that's, if that's what we want it to be. Right. So for Sarah's data set, what, what would you put there? It would be submitted to the city and then the city would submit it. They would have their permit ID. And, and I'm not really sure what ID you mean by permit ID. Permit the, ID. the WD ID is what I was thinking. Um, but Sarah, yeah, Sarah's data does bring up a, 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 a point, which is, uh, um, you know, how, how to fold in data sets like Sarah's if it doesn't have a qualitative one through four score, which is needed for, for management. I don't know. I mean, do, do we want this data set, th this data repository to serve lots of different purposes or are we, are we wanting it to be serving permittees? I think you're getting to your, your uh, jam board. <laughs> well, here, because for instance, right, you, maybe it's the same thing as before where you have, there's a database of MS4 areas, right? Each MS4 is a permittee. And so, you know, you could put these data on a map and figure out what the permittee is. But if you're a group, I don't know, maybe you don't know what permittee area you're collecting the data in. Do we want that to be a barrier to their putting it in or not? Well, I think most people do. Yeah, you know. I guess I would advocate for that if we're just, we're not, I mean, this isn't smarts. We're not trying to just collect the data from the um, permittees. That, that's uh, that's where I'd put my heart <laughs> if you wanted to uh, go back to your Jamboard. Um, it's not just a, a uh, repository for for that data, for those data. But. So that's a vote for not required then, right, Jarma? Yes. Yes. Any other thoughts on that front? I, 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 I want it to be as flexible as possible. I don't, I, I think we might hit some crossroads further down the survey, um, but let's, let's run with that for now. Okay. Let's say no and um, perhaps yes. <laughs> More discussion. I like your flexibility. Okay. Yeah, this, <laughs> these are the easy parts, I think. We're on the easy parts right now. It's going to get harder. So, okay. That's Christine, good. Christine Flowers uh, commented. I don't know if you wanted, if you had something you wanted to say, Christine. Can't quite hear you. I'm muting. I, I had pinged Christine earlier about the question of of um, of uh, counts uh, count counts uh, uh, their relationship or equivalent to scores. So Got one it. through four okay. scores, because I thought she had um, had had worked on that at some point. Uh, oh, sorry to interrupt. No, it's okay. Uh, do we have a do we have a comment from Christine, or we uh, we don't have you unmuted, Christine? No, there wasn't a comment. Okay. okay. Yeah. Hang on. So we're uh, we're just having to work around something. I'm on the iPad, and then we put it up on the computer so we could see the screen. We were listening. Julian saw that I, we were still online on the iPad, and we're just not sure what the question was. But Cecile has just finished up her doctorate. We're doing this kind of work, so. What was the question? We're just I, I, going through these fields one by one. Um, and the question that we were just on was whether or not we should have the MS4 permittee as a required field to put data into this structure. And the argument against was like, well, a group may be collecting data that doesn't have a lot to do with MS, MS4 permittee compliance. Um, and the, the argument, the other direction is that, um, well, it's maybe more useful having that permittee attached to it. 
Well, so then just to clarify, because we, we heard the, and Julian knows kind of the stance that we take on crowdsourcing versus not, you have, if, who's, who else is gonna be inputting data into this? That, and how is it gonna be qualified? And if the permittees can use it, I mean, we just need to have some, if the permittee is the person who's doing the input of the data, then it's repetitive. And if it's another group, don't we, and, but they don't have anything to do with the permittee. That becomes is that, questionable. That becomes questionable. They, if the permittee, I don't know. We're just trying to figure out what are, what are the fields? We, 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 I think we missed part of this. So. Julian, is this what you're looking at for the dashboard and and for the this, grant that we're working on or is this, this is um, this is a brainstorm of uh, so we, we, we've looked at a bunch of different data sets. We looked at the EPA project Zane and Bob were here. We looked at um, a project. Um, uh, we looked at some second nature data that Gary presented. We looked at um, some San Diego watershed data that Sarah Huttmacher presented. So. Yeah. We're, we're trying to create a, a, a minimum viable field list for a centralized repository of, of uh, trash data. And, and so it's, it's, we're looking at common denominators among all these data sets that we're trying to uh, have a sort of suggested list of fields. Okay. Need so, to be so you know, you, in the case of some of the stuff that we're doing, it's sort of like we're doing it with volunteer groups, but the permittee mm -hmm. knows right. that we're doing it. So there's a community, there's there's that communication. So that's the validator for mm -hmm. for the data yeah. and, as well. So yeah, that, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So that 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 was just the question. Because so in... go ahead, Julian. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, that just that just goes to the point that in in most cases, uh, the the permittee is going to be involved. Yes. Whether they're doing the data collection themselves and submitting it here, in which case it is redundant. But but for uh, CDEN or whatever data repository is managing this, uh, uh, that permittee ID is going to be helpful for aggregating data also. Um, and uh, but then where where it's. Uh, or it's not city staff, or it's not a trained organiz a trained organization like KCB doing the data collection. Um, your your point is who who is that? It's who, not who is that. and, and, not and it be could, Joe off the street. Yeah. So. So that's the key, and 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 there's a place for the crowdsourced information, but again, how is that? How is it going to be used? And who was putting it in? And where did it come from and you know all that kind of stuff. So well, there, there's sort of two separate questions here, right? There's the question, I think, of whether or not this data is somehow affiliated or has been blessed or QA'd by an MS4 permittee, right? That that's one thing. Is it somehow yeah. associated with their stormwater program? But then this other question is simply, well, where was it collected? Was it collected which within which MS4 permittee area was that? Right. Right, data yeah. collected. Right. And I think it's the latter that yeah. would okay. want to be stored here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it, if we do what require, it, it gives us some, some filtering aggregation capability too. Okay. What if it's not in it within an MS4 permittee area? I was just thinking again of, of Sarah's data, Jarma. That's that's Creek uh, area. That's yep. riparian area, which is not Part of an MS4, yeah, not required. Yeah, you 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 may go you may get you have an exception option. Yeah, and if you want to do some analysis where you look at data coming from various MS4 permittee areas, well, you've got to pull it out and do it in your GIS because we can't aggregate if you're outside the MS4 permittee area. But now I think I'm convinced now, like not acquiring that is maybe better. But can can I can I just ask one other question because I think it's probably came up while we were not listening, but Julian, did you guys get to the the idea of going drilling down to the PLUs and yeah. So what came out of that? Because I know uh, so I, th there's this field that's that's um 
lo uh, what's the other one we just talked about? Na location yeah, name. location name. And that's we're, we, we agreed that it shouldn't be a required field because um, the, the, the latitude longitude point might just sort of speak for itself. But, um, but if you're working, like if, if KCB is working with a city and the city has the PLUs that they're trying to survey, mm -hmm. then that's the field. So, and and mm -hmm. we have that field now. Okay. Where the, where the PLU goes. So we can't okay. require it. Good. And as we go through this, I just realized, Jarma, is it okay if we kind of go through these as we are now, and then we kind of circle back and figure out sort of fudgeability with, with seed in field or, you know, things like that, that might make them correspond better. Does that work? Yeah, that's fine. I, I don't know that I'll be able to uh, not interrupt you coming from that um, perspective, but yeah. No, yeah. please shout it out. Uh, I just realized that I'm bowling through some fields here that maybe correspond pretty close to a seed in field that have a different word or something, you know, yeah. so. Um, okay, let's just, let's just keep moving through here. We said, okay, I kind of like this one, or maybe this, if we don't need survey type as a field, maybe this field is called survey type. I wrote location type because th there's some overlap between this field and the protocol field, right? Because the protocols tend to be oriented towards a certain type of spatial area of some kind. So we're talking about riparian road, parcel, beach. Does that jive with everybody as a useful way to filter or aggregate the data? And this, these are the next things we get to argue about maybe at an, another meeting, what yeah. the control vocabularies are. What exactly should they be? Yeah. But if we like the concepts, then we're good. Okay, I'm taking that silence as consent. Good. Survey area, again, some overlap with the protocols. The BASMA OBTAs, we have our thousand square feet, meters, square meters? I forgot now, square feet, um, but it seems like something just like we were talking about with Sarah, right? Right. If she has, if she knows that area that they're surveying, well, it's not perfect, but you know, you're, you have a unit that's essentially a volume of trash per area that you could use with in OVTA data. So it's putting in the database. Well, you create the potential for conflict because you're storing something there, but it's also stored in a field protocol somewhere, but it seems important enough to, in terms of the data utility to elevate it to this level, you know. I, I think it's important to have it separately because I'm um, advocating for other, I mean, there may be other protocols um, that may not have that same measure. Okay. I mean, the only danger you incur there is somebody writes something in here, then they go to the OVTA protocol and says, well, they said 500 square meters. So which one is correct, right? Or they updated it or something, but I think it's worth that, that danger. And well, yeah, I mean, because it, then it raises the flag. Is this, is this, are these good data? If they, yeah. they're not following the protocol for this reason. Right or they're making a mistake in the entry for this reason, what, what else is there? So you can almost think of it as a check. Yeah. Well, you could, uh, uh, I suppose each entry could have a, could, uh, you could calculate a density, right? No matter what number they put in there, you could calculate a density, which would then translate between sites. Yeah, I, this is what Tony kept saying, Tony Hale, as we were talking about this, right? Like uh, some fundamental units that we could have corresponding across these different methods. And that would be it. Uh, some density volume per area um, seems like or, the relevant or, one. Or count per area. Or count per area. Weight per area. Weight per area. So yeah, we don't have quite the <laughs> the units on the on the density, but it's some kind of density over area. <laughs> well, if there's some survey that nobody's made up yet, and there's well, we have our area units, but then the next 
well, yeah, we don't, we don't have, that could be in these other tables. We'll get to that in a minute. Yeah, like, what's no, the I, I think we're still learning? getting there. Okay. Survey area units. Um, so again, another, you know, controlled vocabulary that we have to figure out what goes in there. Um, but then sometimes we're just going to have a length, right? Somebody's just going to, they didn't figure out the area. It's just, just a length. Well, we should talk about, do we want that? Do you have to have an area? That's the only way you get to that universal unit, I suppose. Yeah. What can you put in data if you're doing a link? You have to have. I was going to say, like, when you're doing the type of survey that's just a, a length, technically there is a width. Yeah. Right. That's right. So. You know, I don't know what kind of discussion needs to happen about, okay, you know, this is the, the length, obviously, is the most important part. It's going to be a thousand feet, but what's the real width of that thousand feet, you know, where you are looking to take in that amount of trash? Is it four feet wide, five feet wide? And then, you know, you get your length width and then there you go kind of thing. I don't know if that's appropriate. Because yeah, this, I mean, this is why I put no's on here for required, because I'm like, well, that can't be required because you might just have a length. But you can't just have a length. But you, yeah, you never really have a length. So, so you could enforce You that. could always say that the default is one foot and then. Yeah. But I, I wouldn't say it's not required because then people won't put it in, you know. Because if that was true, we can make these required. These would, right? Right. If we can't get area, then it's, you know, then. When you do an evaluation, something will come out as, as infinite because. Yeah. We, we <laughs> can't was get no... Tony's universal unit for that. For like, that I picked up a molecule of trash. Yeah. I, I say, you say yes on the area, yes on the units, yes on the length, yes on the. We could keep these and just make these required though. You need an area. Yeah, just, re I think keep all four of them, but just make them required. Yeah. Well, <laughs> is length required though? Do you have the area? Yeah, because we, uh -uh. No, that makes sense. Nick says yes on everything. So Nick says yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Feel so, so, so if I'm is. sorry, if so if I'm if I'm looking at a parking lot, do I enter? Do I just and I look at the whole area? Do I enter zero for the length? That's what I'm thinking. Is like sometimes that you can still do it, but it's not very intuitive, right? If you're like, where's the length you know. of my transect through the right. parking lot? Well, it doesn't matter what you call the length. It's just one, one dimension, and then you have the area, so you can figure out the other dimension if you wanted to. Well, but so so if you're looking at this picture that Gary has, like, what would you put for the length of this parking lot? The short way, the long way? Doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah. I think it has to be the long way. <laughs> But that's what I mean, that ambiguity, Julie, is why I wonder why we wouldn't just make it not required. So have mm -hmm. the area required, but the length not required? Yeah. Because we need the area. It's more information to know the dimensionality of how you got yeah. that area, I guess. Can you make it required to put either area or length? That's how I had it before, which basically makes none of them required because you might enter one or the other. All right, I think you've convinced me we, the area should be yes, but the length should be no. Okay, you know. okay. let's do that. Well, where are we? No, no. Okay, well, those were hard. This one's easy. Field protocol. I guess it is a link to Definitely. the, well, no, no, it's not a, I guess we need, should we have the link in here too? Like we should have the name of it. 
Yeah. I mean, there's different versions and stuff. I, I think that's a metadata of the protocol that you would store in your protocol valid values. Okay. Oh, like in the lookup. That'll go in the lookup list, right? So V will be a controlled vocabulary too. Yeah. You should probably have that as a field. What do we call it, Jarma? If it's like you can put whatever, what's the field? Oh, it's like a field type. And we would have whether it's a lookup or not. Sounds good. And so that one's a lookup. Um, Units should be a lookup. Units are always a lookup. So look Location up. type. The link we have isn't editable, so we can't help you really fill these in. But the what? The link that we have to see this spreadsheet isn't editable, so I can't oh, really help you fill these in. I thought in. I made it editable. Shoot. Okay. Try and fix that. I'm going to get rid of this one, right? Are you sure you want us? All editing it at the same time. I don't know. Win um, Win was nervous about that before when he sent it out anyway. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'll just be scribe. I'll I'll be scribe. Um, if that's okay. So I'm gonna get rid of this because I don't think we want survey decided, right? Fixed ephemeral, we said is weird. You could just leave it there okay, as we'll marked as the lead. Concept. Yeah. Maybe somebody has some other idea about it. Uh look uh Unique, this is not, that's not, that's not survey date, location name. Location name, is that a lookup? Is there some like site ideas I know in CDN, right? That's like, there's some master list of Well, site so, ideas. I mean, I would think that, yeah, the location name, I think it depends on if we make it required. If we make it required, then yes. And then um, it would come from a lookup and okay. then we could have. Um, okay, so as of now, it's not a, because that's a whole process, right? To update a site on a, right? It's like a different data upload with their metadata associated with a specific site. Yeah, with, with any of the lookups, you have to like yeah. say what it means and yeah, it's a process. Okay, keep it simple for now. Uh, but you could also put your spatial geometry associated with the, the data that could also be a metadata of the site. Right. Instead, but um, but I don't want to skip this one number fifteen there. Um, Dude, it's like... I think it depends on how we do the the per pink and uh, peach or whatever those colors are um, down below. But again, I would suggest having the data speak from themselves and not have to explicitly say what you're putting in and and just put it in. Because presumably there's a linkage from this table to these other two tables via this guy, whatever this is, this survey ID would be common, right? That would be your primary key linking those tables. And so, like you said, Jeremy, that the data is speaking for itself there. It's already linked. Just do you want to be able to filter or do something at this level based on those types or? Maybe we can skip that one and okay. and talk about once we get there the the necessity to have the two different tables. Okay. And it could be those could be multiple. I mean, you could be doing qualitative and count. Yeah, like your Julian's uh, output. Say say it again, Julian. Oh, our our data has qualitative and count, so it wouldn't be right. one or it would have to be a checkbox. That, okay, so that's, I think that's a core issue is like, well, do you store them in the same, when we get to the bottom of this, we'll talk about that, like in the same table, the way you have it there, or, do, or is there enough different information that they go into different tables the way this is uh, structured now? Because if they are in the same table, then we do, oh no, you can't have this because it's all on the same row. You have all this data on the same row, right? An OVTA value 
as well as that's what he has yeah. now but what we were suggesting is that at least in some form of the output it it rotates right okay and if it did rotate though they would be end up in separate then it, tables then it'd be separate yeah yeah i don't not necessarily no well it would be a super long or just one super long table. Because you'd have to have a different row for every item. Yeah. But we could have that. Tall with long, you're supposed to have long, tall data, right? It'll be very long and tall. <laughs> Is that length or width? No, I think it, it could be just uh, long. Long is OK. Long is tidy. In, yes, in, yes. Right? Yeah. Long is tidy data. So. Why does not tidy? I have a question for if so. If someone is going to enter um, the data type for the survey that they've done, right, and they did something like Julian does, where there's qualitative and and count data, would they be able to enter both of those, or would they have to enter in? Would they have to enter this in twice? No. They would not. And that okay. is the benefit of normalizing those tables. No. <laughs> well, okay, wait, okay. Yeah, it just, what do you think, Joe? I think that um, no matter what your interface looked like, you know, your interface could look like just like Julian's does. You, you enter your um, you know one through four and then you have your counts for milk curtains and your counts for pipes and your cans or whatever and you record all those on your on your one form but when it goes into the database it's stored nice and tidy and long and there's yep. date and location and whatever else um, repeated and but the the variable, um, and the variable type are are different, so one could be category, and one and that written, that data point would be one through four. The next category down, next row down could be um, mattresses, and the count would be whatever. So it would get repeated, but you wouldn't have to repeat the entry. Every, every all the data that is common to this, it's a survey. All that stuff just gets associated with these different types of measurements, qualitative and quantitative, whether it's normalized or long, one big long table. So then we don't we don't need line 15 then, right? Because we will know which, which which fields are qualitative and which ones are counts. I guess not. If these are going to be different columns in the so, same row. Well, <laughs> Sorry, I was going to say you might you actually might need the data type because then later if you're trying to query and compare various qualitative analyses that were done, right? That's what it gives you. Exactly. That could be um, lookup value uh, metadata. But don't we know which which uh, fields down below are? Like, like, like we know that, that row 19 is qualitative and we know that uh, line 24 yeah. is a count. But, but so I how would we? This wouldn't, if these were one table, this wouldn't be meaningful because <laughs> one row I would see. contain both. Okay. Yeah, right? It's only if we normalize it that this would be, actually that wouldn't matter either. This doesn't work because if you want one survey ID, you can't, and you're going to collect both of these data types of data in the same thing you're calling a survey. We can't have this field, Unless whether it's you one have long table or separate tables. A, a, the qualitative categorical count, right? Yeah, we can't have it because it will you will mix those types right. across. So the what problem. do you put? Okay. Yeah. Bye bye. Oops, no, I wanted to delete that. Gone. Less fields, simpler, better. Personnel, person, oh no, 
where are we? Field, field protocol, we did that. Geometry, spatial geometry associated with the data collected point, polygon, line. Uh, but just potentially uh, attribute of the uh, location, but you could leave it in there instead. Like yeah, there's a separate table that stores this stuff. Yeah, and in your lookup list of if if you went with the requiring location name, had a lookup list of location names, that would be a, a, a table because you you could have your name, your um, lot long, your uh, uh, geometry. Those can all be attributes of the location. I was kind of thinking of it more in ter terms of like these data that I showed before where it's like, well, this has some geometry, this line that's never gonna be repeated exactly. And right, that's, it's a, it's a, it's a polyline of a certain length that it's just unique to that particular assessment and it's, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't store it in a static way because I'll never repeat it again. It's just that, it's just telling me what type of data that is. But what if, if you had, if we were to keep the survey type and you put fixed, what, what does that mean then to you? It's like, like for the for that field that we're saying maybe get rid of i think it's um you like one of the approaches that people are taking with trash compliance is like they're they have a fixed set of sampling sites within each of their plus mm -hmm. or sometimes it's stratified by their if they got their baseline trash conditions they stratify those sites across those baseline trash conditions so you just keep going back to the same location again and again, the same, the same street segment. So that would be a fixed site. Right, so if it's a fixed site though, wouldn't it have a fixed spatial geometry? Yeah. But, yeah, so that could be stored, yeah, separately. But I was just thinking of it in terms of if you don't have a fixed site and you still wanna have the spatial data. But if it's not a fixed, if you don't have a fixed site, but then you go to the same site next year, what's the difference? It, your geometry will be, sorry, I'm sort of mixing two things. In this, in this field, I was thinking you just store whether what type it is, a point, a line, or a polygon, mm -hmm. but, in, but there would be some other way this, that links these data to that actual spatial data wherever that spatial data is. And the difference from year to year is just might be a little bit longer, might be in a little bit different location, just like those messy data I showed before. It's like, you're looking at the same street segment, but the data that you actually have to work with, it's, it's in a little different, it's a little shorter, a little longer, et cetera. Where do those polyline or polygon data get stored? You have that long here, but where do you store the polyline? That's, I think this is the crux of our, our problem to deal with. We can't store it all where you can look at everything. Those spatial data have to be stored on a spatial data server, either PostGIS or ArcGIS, um, somewhere, somewhere apart from this tabular data. And they can be linked to these entries if you want people to access them. Are there, is there anything else in CDN that's like that, Shara, that you know about? That there's spatial data? Maybe you could store like a long text of mm -hmm. GeoJSON, something like that. Yes. In the cell. Right. Oh. Yeah. I feel like we do that somewhere. I don't know actually if, it, if I'm thinking of a different database. Let me think about that. Like, uh, what's the wetland? Cram. Cram has spatial data. They have polygons for the wetlands. I know. I don't know how they. Those aren't pre-populated, though? 
they're created in the field. Oh, they are. Yeah, but they're not, they stay fixed every year they go, if they go back year after year. Hmm. All right, well, one of these guys. For, for our, our group, what we landed on was, was that we should stick to points and then let the data in analyzer, if they want to link those points to other geometries. Um, just because I don't think we can support that complex uh, thing that you do with Second Nature, Gary. But uh, yeah. so that that's where we landed. But if if we want to make this a, an available field, that'd be pretty cool. Well, maybe this is where we have the offshoot where if you um, we kind of it. Maybe that's what you're saying, Julian, that we have it as a point. It's useful to some extent, useful as a point, and then in something else, um, you have the more detailed like file, I guess. Well, if you have the 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 lat long, it's the centroid, and the length or the the shape the polygon area you could essentially create that space you have you know, that's sort of you could recreate that spatial data if you wanted to the utility is just well the spatial data already exists somewhere and, and you could link to it but maybe most people wouldn't wouldn't want to do that so so if, if if i put polyline here um I would later be able to link these survey IDs to these to that geo uh, data that you mentioned otherwise. So it it could be useful, and I might want to just sort the polyline points out of this data set and do that linking. But for for the for most purposes and for presentation in Seedon, uh, point would have to suffice, right? Um, I mean, we're giving a point as a Latin long coordinate, but is it representing, I mean, it could be representing a polyline or a polygon, but would you ever be assessing a point? Well, I think for the use cases we were thinking of is, is if I were to look at these data on a map, I would see a clump of, um, like if I'm a permittee, I would see a clump of of points um, around a, a, a PLU that I want to track and know the trend on or whatever. Um, and so, and hopefully I would have those PLU numbers in that upper field, the, the location um, name. And so I, I would be able to look at those, at the at data for, those, for that PLU. And I know based on my other computer file what that PLU looks like, the, the shape of that PLU. So I can I can say PLU is getting better, basically, without having to actually link the link the data from those points to a GIS um, of that polygon uh, of that PLU. Does that make sense? Like there, there there's a human. Yeah, it's it's that's saying these points equal this PLU instead of doing it with a GIS. Yeah, yeah. Which and that's the more this. Yeah, that's the that's the way it's amenable to storing in this format. Um, and now that I'm thinking about it, it makes sense. Like th you have all the information you need to do that in these top fields. And if there was some link to the spatial data, it's just, it's sort of similar to linking to photos, right? Yeah. It's very similar to that. That It shouldn't be up here. It should be down here in the actual data in these fields that are the qualitative values because you have a, a feature being served somewhere that has a geometry, has a value, um, and you can link it to these other fields. So is that good then if we just do that? We just describe and some link to this, this goes somewhere else now. This isn't there. 
spatial, oh yeah, I put it right here, spatial data link. But I think it's important that, that people know that that is, is not saying that this point doesn't represent a, an area, right? This point could represent an area, but just do we want to call this point or a reference for an for a actual polygon, right? I think I cut out there. I see. Okay. That makes well, sense. Yeah. So, so the point, but that means because you have a latitude and longitude, right? You have a single point that you were required to put in there. And if you have that point, well, if you put up, I don't know, if, I don't know what point would ever mean, but like if you put polygon in this, that tells you like it, yeah, it's a reference for some area that you were also required to put in for the, for the area. Right. Mm -hmm. I see. So, uh, in the sense that it, it it links to that to that GIS. Well, you could just use these data that way, right? Without linking to any spatial file, you you would have that useful information of the points and the radius, or, or well, you wouldn't have the actual polygon. You wouldn't have yeah. the actual area, unless you took the spatial data link down here. Yeah. So it, it, this is kind of just a tag. It's not gonna. It's yeah. not gonna display the data any differently. Yeah, okay. I think that's. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, that's down down here. If you follow a link somewhere. But then what? Then what is it? It's still not clear. Because point. It, there's no assessment points. They're all assessment areas. We've already um, yeah. said the area is required. So while you might represent it with a line, it is really an area. And so maybe the, the name for that field is, is like, or the, just the, the description of that field is like, is like, uh, links to poly to, to other shape. I think he has that on line 21 spatial data link. But I think you're right. It doesn't belong up here perhaps then, you know, because it's, it's particular to the type of data that were collected. It does this doesn't go anywhere. It's just this isn't meaningful in the absence of because, like you said, we just required it to be an area. So you know it does. It don't. This only matters if you're going to go look at the data. So maybe this belongs down here instead. But all right, I. Yeah. I mean, you could go, you could do that, but I, I'm unclear as to why we have um, spatial data for the assessment area, but I mean, aren't, isn't there an area for where you collected the 12 plastic beverage bottles? Yes, but okay, okay. So we're requiring an area, right? Uh -huh. But the way they recorded the data may just be a polyline, just like the data I was showing on the to inform platform. Um, what's recorded through the Esri collector app is just a polyline. Those are, those are the data. But the field protocol says there's some width associated with that line. That's how you get to an area. It just describes the nature of the spatial data that exists associated with that measurement. OK which the data tells you already, so I'm not sure. <laughs> it's like an, an attribute table for these data. So, okay, maybe, maybe perhaps not necessary. Perhaps not necessary. <laughs> That's why I think it's kind of just a flag is it helps the data processor later yes. identify whether this, this survey ID should be linked to a particular polyline or a polygon, but it doesn't change anything on this side. Yeah. So is that an argument for being up in the survey side of things and not just down on? Well, I think right next to spatial data link. Yeah. Right? Because that's telling yeah. you how, how to link it to the spatial data. Well, okay. it, if it's not going to be required, 
And how are you explaining it to people that might be entering this data? Maybe it go back to maybe it goes back to um, who we're expecting to enter these data, but mm. you know, the, the more complicated your question, the, you know, the less reliable your answer. Gary, can I ask a, an ignorant question about about this? Do do we even need to identify whether it's a point polyline or polygon if if that spatial data link already knows what it is? That's what I'm trying to work through. Is there some value at a higher level? If you're not going to go get the spatial data, you're not going to do that. You're just going to work with what's stored in the table here. Is there some value in in knowing that? Like being able to filter, yeah, or just just know something about they've stored the. I, yeah, that's what I don't know if there's value in that or not. Well, we've marked it as perhaps not necessary at this okay. point. So we, can, we can keep going. Okay, maybe that because the thing I'm always trying to avoid is is potential conflicts. Right, you mark something there and then you go get the spatial data and it's not what that says it is. You, you were essentially storing the same information in two different places. And that's right, database no-no. <laughs> We're not supposed to be, or avoid it whenever we can. Um, and, and that does, it does that, but is it, is, is it worth that cost? Is it useful enough to incur that? But, since we already there? have the attributes of the actual area, the, the one dimension and the area, mm -hmm. then yeah, yeah, I, don't, yeah. I don't know what, why we need that. I, yeah, I'm struggling with whether or not we do either. So maybe that goes away. Well, if 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 you had your PLUs as polygons on a separate on a separate file, right? Then this would be a way mm -hmm. to to link. No matter what you call your area, you say it's a thousand square feet or an acre. Like it would, yeah. it would allow you to link the 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 point that you took that you entered your data at to a polygon, which is static. Well, that's the line 21, right? That's what that does. Yeah. yeah, it. I mean, these would be the raw data. There's another step. When we're talking about POUs, essentially we're talking about some subset of, we can jump down there, I guess. We're talking about a subset of the parcel assessor layers, right? That fall into that category. This is, this is what those are for here. So commercial, multi-flame, residential transportation. The white areas are PLU, the gray areas are not PLU. So it doesn't quite tell you, you know, it's not like a poly, you have to do a step, right? You have to take these data, buffer them out to get, you know, intersect these parcels and then change these parcels to some condition that's like, you know, like a length, like this guy has one there, one there, do a length weighted average for that parcel of those condition values that are adjacent to the parcel. So it's kind of a, I don't think we want to store something at that level that has that level of spatial analysis, um, unless you stored the data that way as polygons, I guess. But you didn't observe, right? You observed here and here. You didn't observe any, this is like, you know, a building or something. You didn't observe in the middle of the building. Right, I mean, I think that's a, a fault with the, the premise or, you know, the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> you get a lot of PLU when you're at airports, <laughs> you know, you're, you're observing the fence alongside the airport and you get the whole airport. Um, can, can a PLU change from being a PLU to something else? Is that like time sensitive? Not sensitive, but yeah, Dynamically. my understanding is it can change. I think um, if I could interrupt real quick, I think it might be nice to spend like the last 10 minutes or so uh, talking about like if anybody on the call has lessons learned that we want to share with each other from the trash track to trash amendments. I don't know. I, I don't want to derail this conversation. Um, but I feel like we might be getting kind of into a lot of the nitty gritty details that we'll be working out eventually. And it could be good to end on a positive note. 
<clears throat> yeah. Or on yeah, that was great. That was a whole bunch of progress. I swear. That yeah, was, that was this awful. looks really good. This looks really good to me. I think that the, this is like, this is the MVP already, as far as I can tell. I have not heard any disagreements that are like, oh yeah, this, this, this isn't even remotely close to what would work. It seems like this is pretty dang close to what's going to work. Next step would be like actually fitting some data into here, I think, yeah. and testing it that way. This is great. I'm looking forward to sharing this with the whole group. Is that all right? Yeah. Um, Definitely. I think it's great. And I look forward to continuing the conversation. I, I would like to not have the two different tables. I think we could do it with the one table. Just repeat, just repeat values and have a big long table. Yeah, I mean, the, with the purple and the pink, I, I don't think we yeah. need two different there. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So um, thank you for that. I'll, I'll uh, kind of shift our focus a little bit to um, lessons learned from all of the efforts that have happened in the track to trash amendments. We've been hearing a lot already from... Um, from groups who have been collecting this kind of data, they're really <laughs> trying to wrap their head around how do we prevent trash? You know, that's the big thing that's going to come out of these trash amendments is we're going to learn how we can, how we can prevent trash from ending up on, on the streets in the first place. And, and yeah, I was, I was saying how to prevent trash is, is, is ban it. Just ban trash. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's it's too bad you didn't bring your own cup. Guess you're not getting a coffee today. You know, too bad right. didn't, didn't bring a container. You have to hold <laughs> this sandwich in your bare hands. You know, like <laughs> um, yeah. I don't know just, if anybody on the call has tried to do that or like actually use the trash not amendment quite data to so do that. Extreme, but um, I've seen. I mean, I've seen. There's a couple of permittees that have you know, ban certain types of, you know, EPS foam foodware in our region. Um, there are, I think, I think it's Alameda City, might be wrong, um, where you can only get um, like compostable to go containers. And there's a few plastic straw, there's a few straw bands, obviously plastic bag bands and such things like that to kind of eliminate those sources. Do, do they have demonstrable improvements in their trash scores? For the, well, the, I mean, the way that they demonstrated for the plastic bag ban and for the EPS foam foodware ban um, was was different than the OVTA scores, but it, it's assumed that if, you know, 5% of all trash going to your trash capture device was EPS foam foodware and you banned EPS foam foodware, 5% of all trash on the street is now. But I, but I heard you say, if you assume that. <laughs> yeah. So has there so that's any actual measures of that? On um, bans leading to a significant enough reduction to lower a score from like moderate to low. Mm -hmm. No, because it's like, you know, you're going, you're trying to take something from 10 gallons down to below, or 10 gallons per acre down to below five gallons per acre. So five percent reduction on 10 it, you know you're still up above nine so it's it's harder to show that um but you can you know eliminate the greatest sources of trash and hopefully start seeing some you know benefit from there but yeah the the best trash control I, you know is is always going to be is as if the trash was never there you know, that's just opinion yeah, that's great. That's a great perspective. And I think that does make sense. The, I always wonder, like, once something's banned, what replaces it, you know? And is the replacement less or right. more bad than the original thing? And that's like, it's kind of like... And the more the more kind of future thinking and, and successful permittees, you know, thought of that ahead of time right because they were like okay all these businesses suddenly aren't going to be able to use this to-go type container that they've been using forever 
So what is the other option? And so they went and looked at what the other options are. And, and so that, that was part of their education and outreach and, and communication program to those businesses that use those things was like, hey, here's your, here's your alternatives and, and here's where to get them. And so it made, you know, cause you have to think about that, right? Like, do you wanna go out and just send your um, inspectors out to just do enforcement all the time on people you find doing the wrong thing? Or do you wanna, you know, help the folks in your jurisdiction do the right thing and say, here's, here's what we're, here's where we're going and, and here's where to get, you know, what may be a better product. Kind of yeah, that's good. That's good that they've already thought about that. I wonder, do other people have different perspectives or, uh, you know, um, things that they've observed in, in their trash to track amendment data? Track to trash amendment, just learn my words. It's 3 p.m. <laughs> Getting too late. <laughs> I mean, something else that I always think about when I'm out looking at trash is what the lifespan of the item was, right? And, uh, and how far it made it from where whoever, whomever bought that piece of garbage to where it resides, right? And so you know, and, and, and we know this with the way that we look at trash with PLUs, where pieces of trash that have a really low lifespan, like cups, wrappers, single use type things, right? They don't make it very far from where they're consumed, right? Like they, the, that item achieves its lifespan in, the, in one to five minutes or less, right? And right. there it, there it remained, you know, whoever was transporting that and didn't quite make it into the trash can or what have you, like, that's where, that's where it was, right? So it's not, it's not far from where they actually bought it as a, and, but when you look at something, you know, like illegal dumping, then the lifespan of those items gets, you, you know, a lot higher because, you know, you're looking at things like mattresses and stuff that their lifespan is like five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 11 years. Also just also other just regular trash that somebody didn't want to throw away. Right. For some, I, that's the most boggling thing to me when I see is illegal dumping. I just can't wrap my head around why someone is doing it anyway. Um, so that's something that I think about too, and kind of like the change that, you know, I ask of myself is, you know, whenever I buy something is like, how long is this going to be useful? And, and hopefully it's, it's a significant amount of time because after that point, it's going to become trash and I can do my best to like kind of control it and, and throw it away properly, but you never really know, you know, after that point. So, you, you know, things like that. That's what I think about it, I guess. Gary, I'm curious, have you have you noticed anything? You have these like multi-year data sets now at this point. Have you all learned anything new from those? Yeah, there's, you know, we see it's really at this stage, it's hard to break out what improvements we're seeing in communities are due to changes in data collection efforts and what are due to actual changes. I'd say after three years or so of data collection, we're just now in a place where we can start to identify those real changes because I think it's sort of like water quality improvements. If you're, if you're measuring at the bottom of a, a, an outfall, mm -hmm. you need a, ba a good, a solid baseline and then a, um, a pretty dramatic change to be able to actually measure it. And so um, in terms of the, we certainly have um, uh, the riparian cleanups. I mean, that, you know, it's just, there, there's, uh, if that's, I mean, it's similar to what Sarah was talking about. It's like, yeah, you, you clean up a lot of trash. So we've, you know, we've worked with the volunteer groups 
in Salinas, and that is shown in the change in the riparian trash data. So that's awesome, but um, that's all I'd say. There's really definitive evidence, but we are working with um, some cities now working towards um, uh, improving street sweeping programs, um, see if that can make a difference for, the, uh, for what we're measuring on the, on the roads. And we do see, like I said, we see some improvements over a three-year period in some communities. It's just a matter of, okay, how much of that has to do with the way we're collecting the data and how much are actual changes? Hard, feels hard to break that out quite yet. There's a- So yeah. it depends on the audience, like, apparent like in this i think this was in a keep america beautiful study and we kind of discussed how maybe some of their stuff is you know a little bit weird but uh, so the idea about removing a trash can entirely to prevent trash buildup in an area has to do with like a, it's kind of a psychological play i think because no one wants to litter but a lot of people will throw their trash like at the trash can and at least you tried and maybe that absolves you of the responsibility. Um, <laughs> or it's full of, and you just balance it on the and top. And it's piled on top. <laughs> but, and this yeah. is, again, you have to be careful of, you know, the audience, right? Like who it is that is littering because if it's, if it's you know, kind of in a nice um, forest or something like that, right? The people that are going there are going there for the, the beauty of the place. So by taking away the, the trash can, the onus, on the the onus to control the trash remains with the person who brought the trash until they bring it out and that so that's the idea behind that i'm not I, you know i'm not saying it's just going to work in every situation but there are there may be you know some situations with certain audience where you know if there's no trash can they won't outright litter there's still that you know, kind of enough of a, of an internal and external pressure and maybe they won't be happy about it, but they'll still keep the trash. <laughs> so that was, that was something that I thought, oh, wow, that's interesting, you know? And yes, uh, John was like, does it get tossed somewhere else? I don't know, maybe the downstream, uh, or not downstream, maybe the gas station on the way out from that place is full of trash. Um, who knows? Well, and if it's just like, I think Gary said, if it's always, the trash can is always full and it's, um, you can't safely deposit it, but people do anyway, could there just be more maintenance and empty that trash can more or put a bigger trash can on there or something like that um, to recognizing that people have trash to get rid of and if they did it a different way, it could be solve that problem. I do like the idea of making people carry their trash around <laughs> with them. Though. You're like, you did this. You know? <laughs> Just kidding. All right, I think we're we're getting kicked out. We are. It's been really fun, y'all. Yeah. See you in the next room. That was a, that was a real dive. <laughs>